yeah thank you <coughs> good evening all welcome to pediatric endocrinology for post graduates 2022 uh, happy new year to all i welcome our president dr shaila bhattacharya who is professor of pediatric endocrinology and pediatrics from jj medical college who is a very enthusiastic and dynamic president of our ispe we have done many programs and especially to teach the pediatric endocrinology to the remotest place of india it was planned this is a third time we are doing we are having very eminent faculty two past secretaries of ispe immediate past secretary dr ahila ayavu madam she is from dknm hospital coimbatore who was also my teacher and very good uh, mentor also dr anurag bajpai sir who was also past secretary of ispe and uh, he is director of medical uh, e classes of pediatric endocrinology we are having dr riyaz sir he is from trivandrum medical college associate professor who is my senior and also mentor welcome you all raghupati sir will be joining very soon he is a patron and uh, main back bone behind this program now i request uh, president dr shaila madam to initiate the process thank you good evening everybody it's my privilege to uh, speaking to you all because you all are the budding pediatricians you know in next few years you all may be budding uh, pediatric endocrinologists also so we from team ispe welcome you all for this teaching of the post graduates pediatric endocrinology for post graduates i am very happy this time at the starting itself we have good number i can see uh, more than 45 attendees so i am very happy you all have joined from the early itself and also uh, last minute uh, linet had to do the case presentation thank you linet for doing it but i request all other post graduates not only listening and learning but i think you all have to start presenting because we are doing this once in three months if you are enthusiastic we don't mind doing every month or every two months but you all have to come forward because when we were students we never had any pediatric endocrine teachers at all you all had to go abroad or somewhere and learn what is even the spelling of pediatric endocrinology was not known but you all are very lucky to have so many classes going all around so i think you all have to make use of it but please come forward and we can make only case discussions rather than we all talking and giving lectures that would be more interactive and which will remain in your brains for longer time if you are discussing more cases so i welcome you all to this and i should thank uh, dr amarna because he is the person who is really working for this he is the one who is uh, taking forward all these things i think uh, we should congratulate him for his hard work um, please continue with uh, dr amarna um, so i i leave amarna to continue all the your proceedings so yeah. the case presentation and to talk by dr anurag and dr ahila and any feedback is there please put it in the chat box so that we also can improve more um thank you very much uh, thank you very much very much madam already 62 participants <coughs> so we are very happy just i will tell uh, how will be the program we are having only one case of diabetic ketoacidosis uh and same case will be discussed for the both uh, presentation of dka and ambulatory management means after management of dka how will you manage and adjust the insulin for the same case and uh, afterwards first lecture will be by dr anurag bajpai sir recent advances in in management of diabetic ketoacidosis followed by dr ahila ayavu madam she will be speaking about the ambulatory management of diabetes then third part will be oski in pediatric diabetes by dr riyaz sir then followed by few theory questions of uh, diabetes 
like continuous glucose monitoring time in range and what are the newer insulins so this time they are asking insulin analogs so based on the dnb and md dch pattern this program is uh, aim first we'll go to the tv uh, ankit shall i share the screen once So, sorry for the delay. So, Dr. Anurag Bajpayee, sir, he is a consultant pediatric adolescent endocrinologist in the Regency Hospital, Kanpur, and also Fortis Memorial Research Institute, Gurgaon. He is secretary treasurer ISPE 2017-18, secretary Grow Society, AAP, Kanpur, and director Medi Classes Learning Grow Society. And he has done FR ACP from the Royal Australian College of Physicians, trained at Royal Children's Hospital, Melbourne. Uh, book chapters in 36 books on pediatric endocrinology uh, sir is very enthusiastic he has written that he was doing md pediatric from aims itself and he was the favorite student of uh, dr p s n meenan he has over 300 presentations in state national and international conferences dr ahila ayavu uh, who was past secretary of ispe presently senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist Deakin Hospital, Coimbatore, and Aditi Hospital, Trichy, and she has uh, very many major achievements. John Funder Prize of uh, Best PhD Research Publication 2013, and nominated for top 18 uh, doctoral from University of Auckland. Recognized guide for PhD in pediatric endocrinology and diabetes, and many publications in JCM, American journals, and uh, Journal of Pediatrics. and dr riya sir uh, is associate professor from the uh, government medical college trivandrum uh, he is secretary iap past for the kerala member central iap executive board and co author for guidelines of uh, ispe hypothyroidism and uh, they have established established the <coughs> misty program that is the free insulin and uh, the glucometer and also insulin pump for the whole state the pediatric diabetes children we welcome you sir we want your inputs for the all pediatricians and budding pediatric endocrinologists they should know how uh, they can do social service about 1 to 2 minutes so me next is uh, dr marnath kulkarni i am the presently dnb academic coordinator and senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist from lotus hospital thank you over to you linet Can I see your slide? Can you see the slide, sir? Yes, we can see. Go ahead. Good. Good evening, Go everyone. I am Dr. Linet, third-year pediatric resident from Sagar Hospital, Bangalore. Today we will discuss a case of 14-year-old boy who is hailing from Bangalore, Hindu by religion, informed his mother and himself it has a reliable history. So he presented to our emergency department with the complaints of increased frequency of urination and thirst since last 15 days and generalized weakness since 15 days. then he developed vomiting and abdominal pain since last 3 days and then breathing difficulty since last few hours before presenting to our hospital 
this 14 year old boy who was apparently normal till 15 days ago and presented to our hospital emergency department with the complaints of increased frequency of urination thirst and generalized weakness the, he then developed vomiting since last three days, which was five to six episodes per day, non-bilious, non-projectile, and containing mainly food particles. He also had history of abdominal pain since last three days, which was diffuse, dull, aching type, with no aggravating or relieving factors and without any radiation. His parents complained that he developed breathing difficulty in the form of increased respiratory rate since few hours. There was no history of fever, loose tools or burning maturation or recurrent skin infections or balanitis in the past, thyroid disorders or recurrent abdominal pain or loss of consciousness. He, no similar illnesses in the past or no past history of recent viral infections or mums infection. He is a first child of non-consignous parents. Uh, there is no history of diabetes or autoimmune disorders in his family. He is a term uh, born by normal vaginal delivery with birth weight of 3.5 kg. He, was, he cried immediately after birth. There is no significant perinatal history. He is, developmentally, he attained all age-appropriate milestones. He is, now he is studying in 9th standard with average scholastic performance. He is vaccinated according to national immunization schedule. He belongs to upper middle class socioeconomic status according to modified Kupusami classification. In emergency department, on examination, he was sick looking, dehydrated, with deep sighing respiration, with fruity smell of blood. He was, but he was conscious, oriented to time, place, and person. On his anthropometric evaluation, he had uh, his height was 153, which comes between 10th and 25th centile, according to IEP growth chart. His weight was 36.6 kg, which comes between 10th and 25th centile in uh, growth chart. His BMA was 15.6, it comes between 10th and 25th centile. On uh, vital examination, he had tachycardia with heart rate of 120 per minute. It was normal volume, a regular rhythm with uh, peripheral pulses were felt, no radio radial or radio femoral delay. He also had tachycardia with respiratory rate of 34 per minute, deep sighing respiration without any retractions. His BP was 100 by 80 in right upper limb supine position between 5th and 58th centile. His saturation was maintaining in room air 99 percent each. Temperature was normal. On general examination, he was sick looking, but he was conscious and oriented. His eyes were sunken, but absent tears. Oral mucosa and lips were dry. No oral thrush. Deep and sighing respiration with ketotic smell. Skin turgor was lost. I carefully looked for other signs of infection elsewhere in the body. It was not there. His SMR staging is stage four according to Tana staging. He had breathing difficulty, so I would like to start my systemic examination with a respiratory system. He had a fruity order of breath with a respiratory rate of 34. He had tachypnea without any restrictions. He had deep sighing respiration, but on auscultation, he had bilateral normal vesicular breath sounds where uh, was there without any added sounds. On abdominal examination, it was scaphoid abdomen, tenderness present over the epigastric area. There was no organomegaly form. CNS examination, he was conscious, oriented. His GCS was 15 by 15. His bilateral pupil equally reacting to light. Torn power reflexes were normal. On CVS examination, he had tachycardia. Peripheral pulses were good. BP was maintaining um, between 9th and 58th centile. His heart sounds were normal without any murmur. With this history and um, evaluation, we have done initial evaluation. It showed arterial blood gas analysis had pH of 7.1. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide was 11.6. pH of 114. Bicarbonate of 7.3. Basics of minus 25, lactate was 21. It was suggestive of metabolic acidosis with a respiratory partial compensation. He had a GRBS of 389. Urine ketones were positive at that uh, bedside. Serum ketones were 40. HbA1c was 13.2. 
Yes, electrolyte showed sodium of 140, potassium of 4, chloride was um, 111. Uh, with this GRBS, his corrected sodium was 144.6 and effective osmolality was 323. On the basis of clinical examination and our initial laboratory findings, diagnosis of moderate diabetic heterosidosis was made and airway breathing circulation was sequeled. Diabetic heterosidosis treatment was started according to ISPAT guidelines. Just wait here. Go back. Uh, now I request examiners to, uh, especially uh, Riyad sir and uh, Ayla madam and uh, Anurag sir, do you want to ask any questions regarding to the history and examination? Because we are discussing the examination case. Any few questions, uh, Riyad sir? Then we'll go into DK part because uh, though we have told uh, two time presentation, we are going to complete within first 10 minutes itself. So I will start with the discussion. Uh, can you tell the what is the importance of age of presentation? Yeah. Age of presentation. Age of presentation. If like early ages, there's a chances of more keto ketosis. Ketoacidosis is more common in the less than five years of age. And duration of illness also. So Sir. Yeah, so I think very it was very nicely presented. What will be the pointer which will suggest that there will be a risk of uh, cerebral edema at diagnosis because that's something which is very important. And did you specifically look for that? Yes, sir. Uh, his level of consciousness is a uh, main thing. We can identify whether it is cerebral edema is there or not. If here this patient was completely conscious and oriented and responding well to our questions. And then next things on evaluation, we can see uh, we have to look for a severe acidosis or like hyper um, um, urea level. If it is high, there is more chance of going into um, a cerebral edema. Thank I think the case was presented very nicely. I think there's not much yes, issues yeah. to discuss from yeah. that. Just one question from the pediatric side, sir, though because it's a pediatric case. Can you tell uh, the, the argonomegaly with diabetes? What are the various causes of argonomegaly with diabetes? So we are asking from the general pediatric side. Please, Lynette, you know, don't confuse yourself. Where you can see even type 1 diabetes with argonomel. What do you think? Any hematological condition which can present with diabetes? It's yes, a thalassemia, sir. Very good. Very because good. of repeated blood transfusion, because of iron overload, they can affect the pancreas. Then they can go into diabetes, sir. Very good. Very good. Yeah. What is the importance of blood pressure with diabetes? Uh, like um, in diabetes, there is like in, if they are in DKA, there is a chance of uh, like they can come go into shock, sir. So if it is like uh, BP uh, BP is less means we the patient is because of dehydration they can go into shock. But most of the time they won't present with shock because of like uh, high osmotic pressure and high osmotic pressure in the intravascular component. Very good. Uh, leave about the uh, this type. Any other type importance of blood pressure measurement? Obese child coming to you. Yes, sir. Obese child with the diabetes and hypertension, we have to suspect metabolic syndrome. Very, very good. Um, can I add a point? Yes. Please. So, in type 1 diabetes, we use blood pressure and uh, pulse rate to guide our therapy. If you have tachycardia and you have blood pressure, which is normal, that is compensated shock, particularly if you feel the peripheral pulses in your peripheral pulses are not felt well. If you have uh, tachycardia and your blood pressure is dropping, then you're going into a stage of uncompensated shock. It also tells you how to guide your therapy. That way, pulse rate and... Uh, BP are very, very useful in guiding therapy also, not only in any other groups. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a code word for the all pediatric postgraduates. Remember to look for CID. C means consciousness level. I means source of infection. D means dehydration. 
So act like CID whenever the patient of decay is coming to you. So it's very, very important. Most of the times you have treated the patient, but fungal infection is going on, resistant infection and uh, acidosis and hyperglycemia. Riyad, sir, you have any questions? Uh, uh, just a comment, like um, um, uh, actually to uh, prevent the decay from happening, we should start suspecting decay. So like uh, when you're taking the history, a child who is uh, already, uh, who has um, um, attained the milestone of uh, dry by night, and then again starting uh, bedwetting. Uh, one thing we have to consider is again, um, uh, it could be diabetes, it could be because of the polyuria. Uh, only if you suspect or only if you think of diabetes, we can prevent uh, a crashing to the hospital with the DK. We have to identify such children uh, before the child goes for a diabetic process. So in history, all these questions we can ask. Thank you very much, sir. Uh... Lynette, can you go back to your uh, uh, growth chart, please? One. So, just I wanted to share uh, as she is a student of Raghupati sir, I am also a student of Raghupati sir. It's a question to Lynette. So, a case of hypothyroidism was uh, coming follow with Raghupati sir. He charts the growth chart height and weight every time. He started seeing some changes in the growth chart and diagnose diabetes before it is going into ketoacidosis. Can you tell what is the clue? It's weightage, sir. Weightage and uh, heightage, sir. If it is weightage, it comes less. He is having uh, malnutrition or like he's losing his weight. So his uh, big, like uh, weightage is low means it is losing his weight acutely. So then we Very can good. suspect. Very good. What else? Suppose a diabetes child is coming again. Next extension of that question. Yes, sir. Started losing the weight. What else you will suspect? Hypothyroidism, you are ruled out. Anything else? What you should screen? Celiac disease. Very good. Excellent. Celiac disease. Thank you very much. He has used the most the recent growth chart. So you have to use this. Can you tell about this growth chart, please? This is ASCII for you. Yes, sir. Uh, this is um, uh, this is our re, uh, latest uh, IAP uh, pediatrician friendly growth chart, sir. It has uh, it is boys growth chart with for height as well as uh, weight. Uh, it has a centile from third centile to ninety seven centile, and it has included a mid parental height percentile calculator along with the growth chart, sir. Yeah, Abu, can you tell about the BMI chart? It's from what age? My chart also included in that. It has like underweight, overweight, and obese category. They have given uh, three lines. If the patient is comes uh, below, uh, uh, above the red line, we have we can consider it as... Very good. Obese. Rajesh is answering from eight year onwards. So we thank all participants who is doing the active chart, charting. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. So other people also should answer. This presentation is for everyone. So uh, three things added newly in this thing. First one is the mid-parental height on left side. Second one, the, the third centile is made red color so that we'll be identifying a very early short stature. Third one, BMI friendly. So you can just by using the uh, scale, two scales, you can calculate the BMI. Go ahead. So you have done excellently. Can you tell? What are the other causes of polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, other than diabetes? A diabetic insipidus can present a polyuria and polydipsia, sir. Then, um, what are the other causes of only polyuria, not other things? Polyuria in pediatrics, causes of polyuria. Others can answer, RTA, someone is telling. UTI, what else? Swati, Dr. Swati, you are the discussant. You can tubular dysfunction, very good. Which electrolyte abnormality can present with polyuria? Very good. Hypokalemia and also hypercalcemia. 
right go ahead thank you very much very good presentation please note examiner can ask anywhere from the pediatric don't think that pediatric endocrinology case is there so that is the idea of this case presentation you should be thorough in all the areas of pediatric excellent presentation linet go ahead thank you very much all the examiners on the basis of clinical examination and initial laboratory findings diagnosis of morbid diabetic ketoacidosis was made airway breathing circulation was adequate dka treatment was started according to ispet guidelines so initial 10 ml per kg normaline bolus was given since it was a moderate dka dehydration correction 7 percentage was done along uh, done over 48 hours along with maintenance iv fluids according to holiday sigar formula 40 millimoles per liter of potassium added to the maintenance IV fluids in each mine. Insulin infusion started at 0.05 unit per kg per hour, one hour after the beginning of the IV fluid therapy. IV fluids, uh, normal saline and DNS and 10 percent DNS were interchanged according to the GRBS level. Vitals, GCS, GRBS, blood gases, urine ketones, serum electrolytes were monitored at regular intervals. Started orally as his general condition improved, and insulin infusion was stopped 30 minutes after initiating subcutaneous insulin, according to basal bolus regimen, as his acidosis and ketosis normalized just before a meal time. Child and parents were counseled regarding the nature of the condition and requirement of insulin for lifelong. Parent education sessions regarding home management of insulin was carried out. Uh, home blood glucose monitoring administration of insulin recognition on treatment of hypoglycemic episodes management of sick days were taught in details to the child as well as parents counseling regarding meal plan and exercise has been done child was screened for thyroid disease at diagnosis and child has been discharged with plan of daily insulin administration and orders for follow up we have uh, sent him home with the uh, insulin of injection novarapid Eight unit three times daily with Lantus twelve unit at bedtime. Now I request uh, both the examiners, Anurag sir and Ayla madam, can ask ask the questions. Okay, so did you give the long-acting insulin one day before uh, shooting subcutaneous, or you gave it uh, simultaneously along the same time with the short-acting as well? Uh, actually, we have start given along with the um, short-acting, sir. We didn't start early. Actually, ideal new recommendations are uh, recommending to give one day prior to the uh, initiation of subcutaneous uh, injections. Sir. And how frequently were you monitoring the electrolytes? Electrolytes every fourth hour, only, sir. Suppose you had persistent hypokalemia, which was there, and it was not getting corrected despite having going up the potassium up to sixty millimoles per liter. What steps would you take in terms of preventing the complications and looking at the cause of hypokalemia? in uh, dk usually hypokalemia is because of the uh, shift of potassium into the cell sir mm -hmm. so for preventing that we are adding uh, potassium into the maintenance iv fluid if the patient has any symptoms of hypokalemia or any ecg changes we were continuously monitoring to see any hypokalemic changes if any changes or, or like severe hypokalemia we have to treat acute uh, correction of potassium Anything else which we like to reduce the treatment dose of something? Insulin we dose we can reduce, sir. but like we have to consider uh, ketosis also during that period. So suppose your potassium is two point eight, what would you do? Would you uh, continue same dose of insulin, reduce insulin, stop insulin? Uh, we can uh, if the ketosis is in the coming down and he is in improving, improve, uh, improving. We can reduce the insulin dose, sir. And any other deficiency we like to think of that can cause hypokalemia in the setting? Any other electrolyte deficiency? Ruchi is saying magnesium, hypomagnesium. So I think key issue is is that potassium is what if your potassium is very low, you are more at risk of dying because of that hypokalemia urgently rather than because of that ketoacidosis. 
So the first priority should be to avoid the complications. So as you rightly said, increase the potassium infusion rate, give acute correction, think of magnesium. But if you are in very severe levels, maybe withholding insulin for some time is not going to be a very, uh, it's going to actually be helpful in that urgent dire setting. Vinit, can you tell about the priming? What is priming of insulin when you start the infusion? Priming, sir? Yeah. So, uh, ideally, we have to start after starting one hour of uh, dehydration therapy. So, dehydration therapy, after one hour, we can start insulin. How will we should you prepare? not start immediately, sir. How will you prepare the insulin and start infusion? Insulin, we can uh, prepare 50 ml uh, plus 50 international unit. It can prepare. It will be 1 ml is equal to 1 unit. We can start with 0 0.05 international unit to 0 0.1 international unit per kg. Uh, after mixing, you want to give just like that? After mixing, you want to give just like that or you want to do something? Some procedure is there. Slow IV infusions. Someone is saying time the line, flush the line. What flesh, are they saying? Huh? Flesh, we have to flush the line with the insulin. Why, why you should do that? If you don't do, what will happen? Adequate amount won't be delivered. Proper amount which you want. Very good, Swati. So, insulin will be attaching to the tube, negative charge, and it will not go. So, there will be no improvement. It is called priming. The most important thing most of us forget. So do that and write, label that priming has been done. So at least 10 to 15 ml of after mixing insulin with the normal saline, you should flush through the tube. Right. Very good. Ayla, madam, do you have any questions? So I have, that's an absolutely brilliant presentation. Very, very well done. All the best. I have no questions for you. Yes, sir. So just I have a one question, uh, quick question. This is for the pediatricians and also other pediatric uh, residents. So whenever diabetes patient is coming to you, you need to take the history as patient went to other pediatricians or not. Huh? Before referring, initial insulin was given or not. Lagupati sir used to say, many patients from Kerala, they were used to refer to the PMC Vellur at least 10 to 20 percent of the children used to die in the train itself in olden days, 1985 or in 90. So what precaution you need to do whenever you are referring the child to the pediatric endocrinologist? Lynette or Swati, anyone can ask. You should correct the dehydration and... Swati, anyone? Not to give bolus insulin, do it bolus, dehydrate. Very good. Whether he had received bolus or insulin there uh, previously or not, and accordingly plan the 48 hour dehydration. Yeah, before referring to the uh, doctor, referral doctor, hydrate first one, give 0.1 to 0.3 units per kg of human atropid and record it when you are referring has been given. It can prevent the DKA. It's the most important step we should know whenever you are referring a patient to the higher center. So tell about the hydration. Second, give one shot of short acting insulin, preferably human act rapid, 0.1 to 0.3 units, not more than that. And whenever you are giving insulin, you should monitor the sugar. Right. Very, very pleased with the answers in the chat box. Everybody has talked about hydration. So hydration, I mean, is the most important part of uh, treatment of DKA. Insulin comes down. Rehydration is the most important one and slow rehydration. So I think anyway, Anurag will be talking about yeah. uh, and also, cerebral edema. And, and also they have commended no bolus insulin. That is also important. Very good. Excellent. You're all very intelligent. Thank you very much, Lynette. Uh, I think uh, we can stop and you can present the last one slide so that uh, we'll continue. Yeah. Ayla, madam, uh, your discussion is completed here only. And here afterwards, only uh, our lectures will be there. Any questions you can ask here about the insulin? They are all doing very well. Yeah. Are much Thank you. Brilliant than us. Yeah. Thank you, Lynette. Uh, we'll see you in between. Now, I request uh, 
the most eminent faculty and most renowned uh, teacher and the research uh, Anurag sir to start the most enthusiastically waiting for your presentation sir. Recent advances in the uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Amarnath, for this wonderful invite and this wonderful program. It's really impressive. And the way you are really galvanizing the uh, postgraduates with regards to pediatric endocrinology, it's really wonderful. And I'll take right from the point that you are all discussing about how prior treatment can have a significant impact. We had this four-year-old girl with severe DK who was managed initially as diarrhea, so not diagnosed early, and then referred to us, came to us with very, very severe acidosis, pH of 6.8, Bicarb of four had drowsiness and an isochoria. Now, this is a situation wherein patients might have received a lot of fluid outside, and what we have seen, and I'll discuss subsequently, that may have cerebral edema right at the time of diagnosis. And this is something which we need to be wary about, and we have to consider that right at the diagnosis, and therefore look at the altered sensorium, look at this situation, and you will identify, and this was cerebral edema right at diagnosis. So while classical Western teaching will say the cerebral edema happens at around 6 to 12 hours, usually it can happen anytime, it can happen at diagnosis and if somebody has received an outside fluid, as we were discussing subsequently, it is something which is extremely important risk factor to assess in that perspective. So I'll be focusing largely with regards to the recent advances with regards to pathophysiology as well as treatment options of DKA and then big mantra which is there for DKA management in 2022 is to go slow. We are not talking about aggressive management, we are talking about slow management, slow and steady would win the race and this is, would be the, the dictum that I will be following throughout in that perspective. All of you can go and have a look at our website learning.growsociety.in where a lot of modules are available, especially the ones on hyperglycemic emergencies as well as various courses which provide all the information in a recorded video format in that perspective. Now, when we talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, it's basically a combination of insulin deficiency and counter-regulatory hormone excess. Both are important, particularly the counter-regulatory excess. The insulin deficiency is responsible for increased amount of lipolysis, subsequent production of ketosis, and this ketosis causes acidosis, rapid breathing, which was present in this case, abdominal pain, and the fruity odor, which was very uh, clearly mentioned in this clear clear presentation. The deficiency of insulin and counter-regulatory excess would cause excessive amount of glucose production in the body and this hyperglycemia will then cause osmotic diuresis causing the loss of glucose, potassium, sodium and water. So there is a huge deficit as far as sodium, potassium and water is concerned and that's the major cause of problem which happens with DKA. Based upon these observations, we can clearly know that diabetic ketoacidosis can present largely with dehydration. Anybody who is dehydrated should be oliguric. If you have dehydration with polyuria, it suggests diabetic ketoacidosis, adrenal insufficiency, tubular damage, or diabetes insipidus. Unexplained encephalopathy of any cause, sugar should be checked. As should be in this case, we had tachypnea without chest sign. Again, very, very significant and abdominal pain. Even if you have mild elevations of amylase and lipase, we have to consider DKA as a possibility. Now, once you think of DKA, the next big thing is to confirm. Any patient whom you are diagnosing diabetes, even if there are none of these symptoms are present, you have to exclude DKA. And DKA criteria is very simple. It is D, diabetes. K, ketosis and A, acidosis. So diabetes is any hyperglycemia beyond 200. Ketosis, I would always prefer that all of you should have access to blood ketone meters. They are much more reliable markers as far as ketoacidosis status are concerned. So if ketone is present and acidosis should also be there. So you need to have all three for the diagnosis of DKA to happen. If you have only ketoacidosis without hyperglycemia, it may be organic acidemia and very rarely not relevant for children, a possibility of a euglycemic DK in the setting of HGLG2 inhibitors or with recurrent vomitings. If somebody has diabetes with ketosis but there is no acidosis, it may be somebody who already has type 1 diabetes and the sick day perspective, it may cause that situation. And if there is diabetes and acidosis, there is hyperglycemia and acidosis with no ketosis, it is stress hyperglycemia. 
So remember, measurement of ketone is absolutely essential as soon as you diagnose anybody with diabetes. Otherwise, they will land up with DK over the next two days. Do not ask them to get back confirmatory lab values. Do not ask them to get an oral glucose tolerance test. Get a ketone levels done right at that point of time to identify the disease. Now, what are the problems which happen in DK? And as I said, there is a lot of loss of water and that really causes dehydration. The average level of dehydration in the setting of DKA is around 7 to 10%, but the accuracy, the clinical accuracy is not very good because if the tongues are dry, that may be because of acidotic breathing, the turgor may not be very low because your osmolality is more. So the thing that you have to rely out will be on urine output, blood pressure and capillary refill. These three would be very, very important and often we tend to use the pH as a surrogate marker of level of dehydration. So be cautious and when in doubt, go a step down in terms of hydration because giving too much fluid may be more harmful than giving a bit less in that perspective. There is a significant deficit of sodium around 6 to 10 millimoles per kg and because of pseudo hyponatremia, we tend to overestimate it. So whenever you are measuring the sodium levels, you have to correct it for hyperglycemia. For every 100 milligram per dl rise of blood glucose, the sodium levels will come down by 1.6. So you have to correct the sodium to get the right value. Potassium again would be falsely high. So there is a significant potassium deficit, but because of acidosis, because of insulin deficiency, the potassium is all outside. As soon as you correct the acidosis as we were discussing, or you give insulin, this potassium will go into the cell. So for every 0.1 decrease in pH, you can assume that the potassium levels will falsely go up by 0.6. So correct both sodium and potassium to get a good information about how you should manage in that perspective. So what are the basic tests which will guide your help on that? Anoin gap is a marker of how many organic acids are there in the blood. So if your anion gap is significant, it will give an indicator that there's a lot of ketones. If you can measure ketones, it's not going to be very, very important. Corrected sodium, as I discussed, very important for every 100 milligram per dl above 100, add 1.6. So if your sodium is 125 and your blood glucose is 600, you have to add 8 to that because for 500, every 100, you have to add 1.6 millimoles per liter in that perspective. Potassium, as I said, for every 0.1 decline in pH, you have to add 0.6, subtract 0.6 because that's the pseudo hyperkalemia which is happening. Lactate may be required if you have persistent uh, high anion gap acidosis. Magnesium, as I said, if you have refractory hypokalemia. Phosphorus, and this is very, very important. I've seen many cases now with the most severe DK pH less than 6.8, where the life and death was not uh, managed because of cerebral edema, but because of hypokalemia, but because of phosphorus. So if you have a very severe DK, always measure phosphorus. And if phosphorus is less than one, you are in trouble. You have to start phosphorus and that will save a lot of things like rhabdomyolysis and hypokalemia subsequently. If there is signs of infection, you can look at blood culture also in that perspective. Now, large amount of this, what I'm going to talk about today would be based upon the ISPAD guidelines along with a couple of our own studies at our center, as well as the ISPE guidelines, which I had the opportunity to write. So this is like a combined one, but largely based upon ISPAD guidelines, which all of you should go and have a look at the website freely available. Now, as was also discussed by Linux, that severity is largely determined based upon the pH, which is a hard marker, along with bicarbonate, and very importantly, the bicarbonate cutoff may be different for younger children. So if you have a younger child, you have to be more cautious in that perspective. So you will use a higher cutoff of bicarbonate. And if there is a mild DKA, bicarb is less than 15, but more than 10, outpatient management is suitable. For moderate, you have to manage in a high dependency unit. And for severe DKA, you would require ICU management in that perspective. Now, very importantly, you have to worry if a child's carbon dioxide admission is less than 10. This means that there is an ongoing hyperventilation and this may be the only marker of cerebral edema in that perspective. If your lactate is high, again, something to worry. As was discussed by Lynette as well, if you're, there is a lot of dehydration, your urea and bun is high, 
That again is a risk factor for cerebral edema. So in our study, as we'll discuss subsequently, very severe metabolic acidosis, pH less than 6.9, outside treatment, CO2 less than 10, these are the risk factor for cerebral edema right at diagnosis and you have to be cautious in that regards. If you have anybody with severe metabolic acidosis who is younger than 5 years of age and altered sensorium, admit in the ICU immediately and low CO2 as I discussed is clearly a risk factor. Now how do we treat and before we go ahead and do precise protocols just to rush through the basic treatment effect which will happen. So the first part of treatment is of course is to give fluid and as soon as you give fluid the volume expands and the counter regulatory hormones go down and that will cause a decline in glucose by around 100 to 200 milligram per day. So you don't need to give any insulin for this decline to happen and if you give insulin in this first hour you will land up in trouble because your glucose will come down very rapidly there would be osmotic shifts which is not desirable and that's why wait for one hour before starting insulin so subsequently once your fluid has reduced the glucose you add insulin and that will typically decrease the glucose by around 60 to 100 milligram per day per hour and there would be a time which will come where your glucose has come down but acidosis is persisting now at that point of time you have to add dextrose to allow the resolution of ketones and acidosis in that perspective Studies especially done at our center and other places clearly show that glucose becomes normal in 6 to 8 hours, ketone in 10 to 12 hours and acidosis 14 to 18 hours. Now remember this residual acidosis especially if the child is fine has a normal urine output beyond 12 hours is largely hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And for that you don't need to do much, don't need to continue infusion and often we tend to have an earlier cutoff in that regard which we'll discuss subsequently in that setting. Now before you start everything, very important to stabilize the child, ensure that there is a good airway. If the child is unconscious or has had a lot of sugar containing drink over the last few, year, a few hours, put an NG tube and remove that because as soon as the gastric emptying improves after correction of decay, this will again cause hyperglycemia in that perspective. Puts two wide bore needles. Very importantly, do not do an early intubation. As soon as you try to intubate, the CNS pressure will go up and that will cause a havoc. So often delay intubation. Do not put central line unless absolutely essential. And if you are putting a central line, give heparin. And this is very, very important and low molecular weight heparin. Otherwise, you will land up into problems. Do not give too much fluids not more than 40 ml per kg in the first hour, four hours and more than three liter per meter square per day. So avoid excessive amount of fluid in that perspective. Now what should be the cause of worry? If somebody presents to you with shock and this is very nicely discussed by Linnet that in DK you've got a lot of volume excess, you've got a lot of these osmoles which are there, your counter regulatory hormones are high so you, there should be no hemodynamic instability. If somebody has got shock exclude sepsis in that perspective. If there are features of altered sensorium, drowsiness, hypertension, bradycardia, anisocoria, breast DTS, think of cerebral edema, give mannitol and a slow correction. Of course, look for potassium changes, look for hypokalemia and defer insulin, start potassium in the infusion and if there is a persistent fever, think of antibiotic treatment in that perspective. Now, the first question which comes in, whether we need to give fluid bolus to everybody. Now, we would definitely recommend it if somebody has tachycardia or shock, but I have found that even if there is a mild decay and you want the child to go home, if you give them some fluid, there will definitely be improvement because their counter regulatory hormones will come down, maybe a slower fluid will be good. So before you don't want to admit them, give them some fluid in the emergency, give them some subcutaneous insulin, they will have a much better outcome in that perspective. The dose is typically 10 ml per kg, usually over one hour, you can repeat if shock is present, but do not give more than two boluses and never give more than 40 ml per kg in the first four hours. This is what we discussed earlier in that perspective. Our subsequent management is very easy. The SPAD guidelines talks about maintenance and deficit over 48 hours. So the typical holiday SEGA formula 4 to 1 rule along with the dehydration level 7 to 10 percent you can then decide about giving it over a 48 hour period. Normal saline is a preferred drug in that perspective uh, 
but there are now studies which show that you can use half normal as well usually less than double maintenance and if you have a child who is about 30 kg better to use the bsa based formula of 1.5 uh, liter per meter square uh, in that perspective would be the appropriate one to avoid unnecessary too much fluid now there has been a lot of discussion especially in the western age group and this is an important recent advance this was a large multicentric trial the pecker and dk fluid study largely then in western centers in milder cases of dk and what they said that whatever fluid you use whether you use normal saline or n by 2 you use it slowly or you will use it rapidly there is no difference with regards to the cns outcome the children who develop altered sensorium do not differ so what they're trying to say is that in these individuals fluid does not make a huge difference in that perspective but remember the average pH in these patients was 7.17. The one in our study from India was 7. So we are having much more severely affected individuals who come to us with DKA. It may not be appropriate to extrapolate these findings which are there for milder category of DKA in an already good setting to our setting and in that perspective i would say avoid rapid fluid use normal saline because if you use half normal there will be a rapid fall if you have somebody who is 7.17 ph often we tend to don't even manage in the icu definitely in that setting you can use any fluid but usually if you have a severe decay be cautious that's something which is very very important from that perspective now what about insulin so fluid is the fundamental aspect to start off insulin ideally should be intravenous insulin but there are definite protocols which have been shown from uh, dr ragupati and dr ahila's group uh, the velour group and who have shown that intramuscular insulin is another way of managing dk again definitely a good one in resource poor setting so if you have uh, somebody in a remote area you give them uh, the intramuscular injection of insulin which may work for around two to three hours give them some fluid, stabilize them initially and then refer and write exactly what has been given as Dr. Amanath and Dr. Ahila was talking about. Insulin infusion again, low versus high dose, 0 0.05 versus 0 0.1. In this case, we had used 0 0.05. Both are reasonably effective and I'll discuss about the evidence for the same. As Dr. Amanath said, always flush tubing so that you do not waste time. By the time insulin passes the tubing, don't make the rapid changes make slow changes in insulin doses and do not dilute so ideally 50 units and 50 ml that will be the ideal one in that perspective do not use piggyback uh, burette sets because that can cause confusion in that perspective now this was a randomized trial about low dose versus high dose now not a very big study what it clearly shows is that the lower dose of course had a slower correction but the risk of hypokalemia was less so in a way as i said the mantra in dk is to do less less fluid less insulin this is something which is coming clearly from that perspective so low dose insulin is a good option definitely if you have an infant definitely if you have a malnourished child start with 0 0.05 otherwise 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 are pretty similar in that perspective now, once you've started the treatment, which is very standard, the most important aspect is to monitor. The sensorium should definitely improve. The hydration should improve. Very importantly, urine output should be closely monitored. Acute renal failure, acute kidney insufficiency is very common in DK and it is one of the most devastating complications uh, which can cause a lot of problems. So as soon as your urine output is coming down, you have to be cautious in that perspective. Use corrected sodium, which should remain stable in that regards. Potassium should remain normal and ketones, as I discussed, should improve and resolve by around 12 hours in that perspective. Now, how do we react to particular levels? If your potassium goes below 3.3, if your potassium in the beginning was less than 3.3, you right away start potassium in the hydration phase at 20 millimoles per liter. So the normal cell you're giving for the first dose, you add potassium there, do not start insulin. Subsequently, if your potassium is normal, you start 40 millimoles in fluid and more than 6 millimoles, you definitely have to avoid. So the only reasons why you don't have to add potassium is anuria, ECG changes of hyperkalemia or potassium more than 6. The pointers very importantly for hypokalemia may be polyuria, as we were discussing about what causes uh, polyuria is electrolyte abnormality, myopathy, 
and very importantly you may give a rapid correction increase the infusion to 60 millimoles per liter very importantly reduce insulin and in some cases we had had to temporarily stop insulin because potassium if it's not given properly in the beginning it can cause havoc your potassium will go to 2.5 2.4 and then you are on a fix potassium is what is going to cause death in this case not other factors and consider magnesium in refractory cases dextrose if a sugar goes uh, below to 300 start 5% dextrose below 200 at 10% dextrose because dext glucose will come down rapidly there will be more time with regards to the resolution of acidosis early initiation of glucose of course is mandatory now this is important there is no role of sodium bicarbonate treatment in dk unless there is refractory cardiac event and there is a refractory hyperkalemia so no soda bicarbonate if you have persistent acidosis look at ketones if ketones are high your ketoacidosis is not resolved if ketone is low and then i said that if the child is normal this could be a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis in that setting you look at the chloride load which is sodium minus chloride minus 32 if the chloride load is less think of lactic acidosis if it's high it's hyperchloremic so acidosis beyond 12 hours if it is persisting child is stable and smile consider the possibility of alternate diagnosis in that perspective and this is something which is self-resolving over time in that regards high anion gap may be the other marker which you can consider for lactic acidosis in that setting now bicarbonate as i said should be avoided it causes cns acidosis it causes hypokalemia it causes lactic acidosis the treatment of acidosis is only given with bicarb if there is very very high hyperkalemia there's cardiac arrest hemodynamic instability and that too as infusion so this is something do less so i talked about less fluid less insulin and no bicarbonate clearly in that regard one key point of phosphorus which we have now seen a lot of experiences because of phosphorus deficiency your oxygen delivery may be affected it may also affect your sensorium there is a risk of myopathy and if there is muscle contraction there could be rhabdomyolysis so hypophosphatemia is something you have to be very bothered about and the features are if you have potassium which is phosphorus less than one you have to be very worried and if there is encephalopathy myopathy again you have to worry best would be to give 50 percent of potassium correction as potassium phosphate easily available in anybody with severe dk we use now potassium phosphate that really helps out however you have to monitor calcium in that perspective now, the complications to look at in this regard would be cell edema which usually happens with severe disease too much fluids soda bicarbonate treatment and osmotic shift it has high mortality and morbidity so give less fluid and slow correction to achieve a good outcome any child whose sensorium is becoming bad and glucose is normal do not do an imaging rush them for mannitol and mannitol is preferred over three percent saline because there is also a cytotoxic component which is there hypokalemia happens with insulin therapy you have to supplement uh, acidosis if it's persistent you think of ketosis infection and hyperchloremia do not give soda bicarbonate there could be risk of infection so be very careful thrombosis so if you have pain in the leg it may be either a rhabdomyolysis or a thrombosis think of uh, a low molecular weight heparin and rhabdomyolysis if there is sudden pain and there is hematuria which is happening followed by oliguria in that regard so cell edema i said is one of the major complications which we see in that perspective it is both because of the osmotic shift as your glucose goes up the cells shrink if you decrease your glucose quickly the osmotic imbalance causes cell edema to happen as soon as insulin therapy is given the cells will swell up and cause edema so this is clearly the osmotic theory there is also now a concept that there is an intrinsic problem in dk so there is a perfusion hypoperfusion reperfusion which causes damage risk factors are soda bicarbonate in that regard severe disease insulin bolus too much fluids and bicarbonate very importantly it may happen at diagnosis not related to osmolarity and there is also a cytotoxic theory so you have to be always cautious about cerebral edema in every child with dk whatever the level of atherosis treatment has been given outside be more cautious in that perspective and we have to be very very careful in that regards this was a landmark study which was done by glaser et al earlier which clearly showed that a younger age 
recent onset diabetes and high urea nitrogen ethylene was saying our risk factors for cellular edema and co2 again is important in this we have to be cautious in our study we found all these parameters along with prior fluid therapy which is important in our publication of 107 patients with dk we found cellular edema at diagnosis very important uh, was very common and after that the risk was much less and there was a good outcome so new onset patients in prior treatment were clear cut risk factors with odds ratio of 3.5 and 4.7 so if somebody is coming for the first time with dk and they have received treatment outside be very cautious if the ph is less than 6.9 co2 is less than 10 again very cautious in this perspective acute kidney injury is something again which we are seeing a lot it's common and if somebody is more dehydrated and more severe decay it becomes more common the pointers are that if the urine output is below 1 ml per kg per hour or there are fluid overload you have to think of it management of renal failure with dk becomes a challenge you're giving too much fluid on one hand and your kidneys are shutting down so if you don't reduce fluid you will have cerebral edema you will have pulmonary edema so in this perspective what we need to do is to restrict fluid and consider early dialysis so my dictum is always monitor urine output if urine output is going below 1 ml per kg per hour correct high dehydration if it's present if not rush towards dialysis that's the only thing which can save otherwise there could be huge problems in that regards rhabdomyolysis is something which can happen with severe hypophosphatemia if the levels are less than one usually you will have sudden onset pain in the legs weakness and dark urine and high cpk will give you a picture anybody with severe dk monitor phosphorus phosphorus less than one give phosphorus and if you have pain in the leg look at cpk the management is usually dialysis and decreased potassium supplementation in that regard so just to summarize the overall developments with regards to dk management the first phase is of course hydration do not give too much fluid only if required bolus will be of help give deficit and maintenance over 48 hours evenly insulin at 0.05 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour potassium unless there is anuria or hyperkalemia and the third phase as soon as the glucose becomes less than 300 you start dextrose in that regards no role of soda bicarbonate and beware of cerebridema so if we now talk about the dk management as i discussed earlier in 2022 there is a tight rope you have to balance between doing too much and too little you can give too little fluid and that will cause prolonged dehydration you can give too much fluid and that will cause cerebral edema you can give too little insulin and therefore you will need more time for the resolution of dk if you give too much insulin there would be severe hypokalemia now the question is whether you will prefer a child to stay a few hours more in the icu correcting dehydration over some more time and maybe staying there and then going off home or you would like somebody to have cerebral edema or severe hypokalemia the leading two causes of death in dk the choice is clear the mantra for dk management in 2022 is do less less fluid less insulin no bicarbonate and more potassium i think that's the key in that uh, perspective uh, in that regards what we have seen that despite all these protocols being available there are a lot of uh, errors which happen in management in fact in our center where we have a written protocol if we carefully looked at our log and this is just being published in indian pediatrics in the journal of pediatrics what we found that a lot of 80 percent had got a lot of errors in terms of management of dk and these errors could have been responsible for preventable 32 percent so one third of hypoglycemia two thirds of hypokalemia and one third of dehydration was because of these initial management errors now if you do the management errors right at the beginning you will have a lot of problems and they will not improve and for that we have now developed and validated a mobile application which helps you in an approach pathway along with the exact output with regards to the dose of insulin required the amount of fluid required how do you monitor in that perspective uh, and also on follow-up which test to do and how to follow up so this mobile application is available on the uh, both android and iso you can have a look at it and it really helps you guide this is one part of it to easily and use the proper protocol for appropriate management so i think i'll stop
at that point of time it was an interesting discussion and uh, we'll carry forward from there thanks dr amana for this opportunity thank you very much sir uh, just one or two questions from the audience so one question from my side is in severe cerebral edema with the severe dka uh, how much fluids you want to give so if you have a established cerebral edema which is already there we generally want to restrict it to around one, two thirds of the fluid that you plan to give one option would be to correct it over 72 hours the key for management would be the acute management of cerebral edema because that's the most important so head and elevation mannitol these things are very very important i've seen patients who are actually having uh, just coning uh, anisocoria who are having uh, imminent coning as soon as you do these basic steps they improve and then it's more like uh, uh, giving lesser amount of food over follow-up. If you want to prevent cerebral edema, I think that's what is more important in that perspective. If you have somebody who's uh, having very, very severe acidosis, pH less than 6.9, somebody whose CO2 is less than 10, somebody who has received food outside, I would say right away, give a correction over 72 hours. And this is a strategy which we've been using and it's been quite effective in that perspective for preventing of these uh, complications. Yeah, and below five years of age, we are using only 0 0.05 units per kg per hour. Yeah, so 0 0.05 and 0 0.1 both have equivalent effect. As I said, ideally, if you ask me, I would say 0 0.05 could be the standard dose. And we may actually use lower doses in the other perspective because often I tend to decrease the dose because we don't want that rapid fall in glucose. What's the advantage in giving too much insulin? It's not going to anyway correct acidosis that quickly. So you will have more problems of hypokalemia. That's a big problem which happens. Yes. And of course, cerebral edema, which can happen in that regard. Yeah. So Last, and younger children, definitely. Yeah. Do Last one question asked by the audience, sir, uh, about the use of uh, bicarbonate. I don't think now we are using it all. So if you I have think... severe hyperkalemia, if you have cardiac yeah. arrest because of hyperkalemia, that is the only thing okay. we're using. But that I have not encountered. I have not used bicarbonate. I've used it in one case now i don't want to generalize that that was a case who had received he was a five-year-old child with the most severe dk zero bicarb and he had been given metformin by someone and that's why it caused lactic acidosis as well now this fellow despite everything his bicarb was not improving his acidosis did not his bicarb was not becoming even detectable after 12 to 48 hours and then we had to do dialysis we had to give bicarb so it is for a very well there's nothing never know in medicine but i would say from a generic perspective yeah. from a postgraduate perspective this no would be quote unquote the one statement yeah a big applause to anurag sir uh, every year we are listening to sir again and again they are doing a lot of research and bringing with uh, very good colors thank you very much sir please thank continue you. to educate us and uh, please come to these classes whenever uh, needed we need your thank blessing you. sir thank you very much sir thank you thank you dr Manan. yeah now I request uh, my uh, mentor and teacher, Dr. Ahila Ayav, madam, to continue with the ambulatory management of uh, diabetes children. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, Amarnath? Yes, madam. This was well. a brilliant lecture by Anurag, and I think the, all the audience would have found it extremely useful. Um, and they were very, very, uh, there were a lot and lot of uh, points which will help you in your clinical practice, uh, not only in your exams. Thank you so much, uh, Amarnath, for this kind opportunity. And I'm thankful to uh, Raghupati, sir. Um, and thanks to Dr. Shaila and uh, Ganesh also for uh, uh, helping with this program and uh, seeing that this becomes more useful for postgraduates. I'll just continue on from where Anurag left. So I yes. think uh, that was an excellent presentation by Dr. Anurag. And uh, the presentation by our uh, Dr. Lynette earlier also was really good. And I think they set the setting for a uh, good presentation. So I have uh, a written permission for the use of photographs, which I've used in this presentation. And I don't have any conflict of interest for this presentation. So I think we had enough of a discussion on when you would suspect. And uh, uh, all the questions have already been answered. But the only point I would raise is like how uh, Riaz talked about when you check blood sugars and if it's 200, more than 200 milligram per DL, please admit the child into the hospital. There's no way you're going to ever send a patient home and ask them to come for review. I think that's one important point all pediatric trainees and pediatricians have to carry. That is how you're going to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis so that you get the patients early and carry them forward. So I think um, um, 
the uh, important point is just a minute one minute one minute manima neengle pano thambi to aikku uh can you hear me just a minute okay um so there is uh just a minute Yeah. So if you uh, check blood sugars and you find it more than 200 milligram per DL, you have to admit the patient into the hospital for education and to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. Any number of times you're seeing patients being asked to come back for oral glucose tolerance test to diagnose diabetes. And I think that's unacceptable. You're going to miss the golden uh, time that you could have achieved uh, or uh, taught a child and prevented the child from landing in DKA. So when would you transition to regular dosing of insulin in DKA? Um, earlier, I think during the discussion itself, Amarnath and uh, Dr. Anurag had this discussion on when you would add uh, uh, the long-acting insulin or basal insulin, whether it would be a day ahead of stopping IV insulin infusion or uh, prior to the uh, stoppage. Because I'm actually uh, using subcutaneous insulin in the treatment of diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, we don't have this uh, difficulty in transitioning, but whenever we've used IV insulin infusion, when you have to start rapid insulin, one of the analogs, you have to give your first subcutaneous dose 15 to 30 minutes before switching off your infusion. And for your regular insulin, it has to be an hour or two before switching off infusion. You have to remember the insulin in infusion always works only for two to three minutes. So you have to remember, as soon as you switch off your insulin infusion, you're going to have no insulin in circulation. So it's important to give the doses prior to switching off so that you have an adequate level of insulin uh, acting on the child before you switch off. And best time to transition when oral feeds are tolerated or just before a meal, it is so much easier to transition to the subcutaneous insulin. How do we uh, do the insulin, subcutaneous insulin infusion, I mean, uh, dosing? So we roughly calculate about 0 0.7 to 1 unit per kilogram per day. Please remember in peripubertal children, they are insulin resistant. And because of DK, the resistance may be even more. So the dosage may be a little bit higher in peripubertal children. In younger children, we calculate roughly about 0 0.7 unit per kilogram per day and divide it into four Kali doses and then give it every four hours. And then at the appropriate time, you also start the long acting or basal insulin and then shift to a regular uh, dosing. We are on a basal bolus regimen. So we give a basal and usually I prefer our glargine basal in the night and for our uh, boluses for breakfast, lunch and dinner, depending on what you're going to use for your uh, dosing. So there are several types of insulin, which I think we've already uh, uh, discussed about, or I think at least there has been a mention, analogs, it would be aspart, lispro, glulisine, regular insulin, NPH, and your peakless insulins, including glargine, levimir, and deglutec. I think this was a very interesting slide. There is a research going on in the US currently on inhaled insulin. The earlier ins inhaled insulin, which was introduced in 2006, was withdrawn because of a suspected risk for uh, malignancy because of the huge doses that were used during inhalation. But the recent advances, I think this may be out within the next uh, few years, that would almost mimic your uh, insulin production in a normal person. Rapid acting insulin, the insulin aspart, resistor, or glulisine, we always give it about uh, 5 to 15 minutes before taking your meal. And the faster acting aspart, it can be given and the food can be taken immediately. We also use regular insulin in younger children because they eat more frequently and we find it easier to dose these children because they can have two, one major meal and one minor meal for every dose of regular insulin. We also use NPH because when you use NPH and regular insulin, you can give it as a split mix regime. The cost of therapy is extremely low. Uh, 40 unit per ml vial of NPH costs about 130 rupees. Whereas if you buy a pen cartridge, which costs 100 units per ml, the cartridge would cost about anywhere from 370 to uh, 600 rupees, depending on what you are buying. So in certain situations, we continue to use regular and intermediate insulin. 
as a split mix regime but pre mixed insulin are an absolute no no for children long acting insulin we use glargine and i've used glargine even in very young children as young as 2 years and 3 years of age i use degludac in slightly older children but because one particular the most important point that actually restricts my use is the cost of degludac and the amount of insulin that's available and the amount you would have to waste if you're going to use it in very young children so those are the only two restrictive points otherwise degludac is also an extremely good choice i'm not a big uh, i haven't used 2go which is a highly concentrated glargine as a basal insulin because it's still not recommended in young children so what are the short acting insulins so from the normal pancreas this is what you would see and when you give inhaled insulin it might work like this this is what they think would happen this is regular human insulin it works it peaks at about 1 1 and 1/2 hours and lasts for about 6 to 8 hours this is glulisine aspartate lispro which starts working and the first 1 hour it works for 30 30% will be used in the first 1 hour another 30% in the second hour another 30% in the third hour and the last 1 hour you'll only have 10% left and most of the carb meals will have a blood glucose which is present for about 3 hours so these rapid acting insulins are a good choice to cover carb meals if you are not going to take any carbs in between it is really good to take that so the ultra fast acting insulin is the faster acting aspart the onset of action is even faster than the uh, analogs and it is uh, good to cover the peak because in uh, well refined carbohydrates the peak may be quite high and these uh, ultra fast acting insulin are supposed to cover the peak quite well so i think all of us know basal bolus regimen split mix regimen which is the older way of treating patients we still continue to use it because the cost of therapy is extremely low and it is twice daily in some and sometimes only thrice daily insulin pump is an absolutely brilliant uh, uh, innovation and very helpful but the cost of therapy is the huge uh, is the reason main reason for the restricted use of pumps in india pre mixed insulins not recommended in children whether you use 70 30 or 50 50 this is absolutely a no no for children with diabetes i'm just building up my uh, presentation so that we are going to see some cases and we'll work up on how we're going to do so these are the calorific requirements which is recommended by the uh, united nations these are quite complicated to calculate so we have a, a easier way of looking at calorie requirement for boys it's a 1180 and girls 1140 by the food and agriculture organization of united nations but if you look at par at one year of age the amount of calories that is required for a child is 1000 You just use that that's quite an easy way to remember so at 1 year of age you need 1000 kilo calories add 100 kilo calories to that 1000 for each extra year of age so if you're 2 years of age 1000 plus another 100 if you're 5 years of age 1000 plus 400 so for each age so it becomes 1000 kilo calories at 1 year of age 1100 at 2 1200 at 3 and 1000 300 at 4 so it is just you add 100 kilo calories for every year after one year and that is the amount of kilo calories you require every day what is the proportion of major nutrients and insulin requirement your fat is about 25 to 35% and your saturated fat should be less than 10% proteins is about 15 to 20% and your carbs are about 45 to 60% so you roughly keep your carb is the only insulin is calculated based on the carbohydrate content of food so your food will have 50% carbs though south indian food actually has huge amount of carbs and very little of protein and protein we still need to remember it is important to have a sensible portion for all major nutrients so it's about 50% carbs so take it's a 7 year old child the total calorific requirement for one day will be 1600 calories and out of that 50% will be carbohydrate so that's about 800 calories will be carbohydrate split it across meals so for each a uh, gram of carb you will uh, each gram of carb will give 4 calories 
So you need 800 calories for a seven-year-old child from carbohydrate. So 1,600 is the total calories. Half of it is carbohydrate, 800 calories. And each gram of carb will give four calories. So divide by four, you will have, you will need 200 grams of carbohydrate per day. So now all of us are educated in nutrition extensively during our pediatric training. So you know the carb content of most of the foods that you're going to eat. So you will know carbohydrate counting is essential. In basal bolus regimen, you will have a peakless insulin and you will have short-acting analogs covering the meals. Okay, so if you have a basal bolus regimen and I'm using regular insulin because it's cheaper. So I will give regular insulin for breakfast. I'll give regular insulin for lunch and I'll give regular insulin for dinner. So what do I do? Because it works for six to eight hours, we give our morning dose at usually 7 a.m. So that will work for about 12.30 to one o'clock. So your peak will be about an hour later. So we always give our regular insulin about 15 to 30 minutes before our meal. So give regular insulin and then half an hour later, we give our meal. So you have one again, but at about three hours, the carbohydrate would be over, but your regular insulin will still be acting for six to eight hours. So you can have a dip in the mid morning. That's about 10 a.m. or so. If you're given your breakfast dose at seven, you can have a dip at around 10. So we always give a minor meal there with minimal carbs. Again, for lunch, we give at 12.30 and our lunch is at 1. And then we give a mid-afternoon snack at around 3.30. We always give our dinner a bit early for most children for two or three reasons. One, when they come back from school, they're very hungry. They want a huge meal. So we give our dinner by about 6, 6.30. We give our evening dose and give our dinner a half an hour later. And we give a late night snack at about 9, 9 o'clock or 9.30. That would have lesser carbs. So we have six meals and this is something which we prefer in younger children who like to eat more frequently. For older children, we prefer analogs and we give only three major meals. So depending on the number of meals, we'll calculate our carbs. So we have three major meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And then we have a mid-morning snack, a mid-afternoon snack and a late night snack. So two portion of carbs for breakfast, two portions for lunch, two portion for dinner. One portion for mid-morning snack, one portion for mid-afternoon snack, and one portion for ni late night snack. So that's six, seven, eight, and nine. So nine portion of carbs you need. So for the seven-year-old child, you need 1,600 calories. 800 calories is from carbs. And for that, you need about 200 grams of carbohydrate. So this 200 is divided by 9. So that's 22.2 grams of carb is one portion. So breakfast, they get 45 grams of carb. For lunch, they get 45 grams of carb. And for dinner, they get 45 grams of carb. For the, each of the snacks, they get 22.2 grams of carbs. So that's how you split your carb and you also cover your insulins. If you're going to give only three major meals, Divide the 200 grams of carbohydrate that you need by three and give for each meal, it will be about 66.6 grams of carbohydrate for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then you can style your insulin an analog to that three meals. This is what we use regularly in quite a few of our younger patients. Basal bolus regime with glargine and regular insulin. Uh, so regular at 7 a.m., 12.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m. Our breakfast is half an hour later. Lunch is at 1 and dinner at 7. And we always tell them what are the carbohydrates that they can give their families. We also include milk, banana, or, or most of the high-carb uh, fruits, everything, all uh, roots, tubers, everything is included in this. We tell them these are the things that can be had for the ma major meals. For the minor meals, we use lesser carbs. We use a lot of uh, vegetables and then we also tell them to have uh, green gram, sprouted green grams and soya, paneer. And you remember all your uh, proteins don't need much of carbs. So they can take a lot of, uh, they can take some fish, they can take some omelette or something like that and a smaller quantity of carbs with this. This is how we do our snacking for them. So this is, I drew my own because I didn't have to uh, buy for copyright. So this is how I give my car. So this is, our basal insulin, which is given at around 9 p.m. if we are using glargine. Why do we give at 9 p.m.? It works for 18 to 24 hours. 
So if you give at 9 p.m., by around 6 p.m., the action of glargine will start dipping. We will give our regular insulin at 6 p.m. So that will take care of the dip in action of glargine and cover it and you don't have a high blood sugar. Whereas if you give glargine in the morning, they usually have an early morning high because the duration of action is about 18 to 24 hours. It starts dipping by 18 hours. So at around 3 or 4 a.m., they start having a high. So it's quite difficult to manage that high when you give glargine in the morning. And that's why we prefer a glargine in the evening. But if you use d -Gludec, which works for about 35 to 36 hours, we use it in the morning because it helps us to uh, look at achieve equilibrium and try to adjust the dosing. So this is how we give one regular insulin for breakfast, one dose for the lunch and one for the dinner. So if you are using with rapid acting analog, when you are using uh, a, an aspart or a fast acting aspart or a Lispro or a glue receipt, we give d -Gludec in the morning because this has a duration of action for 35 to 36 hours. Glargine means it's in the evening. Breakfast, we always tell all families to have breakfast by 7 to 7.30 because you should remember your circadian rhythm. You listen to Dr. Anurag's uh, uh, lecture on counter-regulative hormones. So your cortisol, your growth hormone, all of them would start raising your blood sugar even without a meal if you delay your breakfast. So that's why we always tell even for people who are on basal bolus regimen, unless you are on a pump, it's better to have an early breakfast. Lunch and dinner can be your choice. If you want an extra carb meal or a special treat, you can take another dose of the uh, short acting or the rapid, uh, rapid acting analogs. Lunch and dinners as per choice and every carb meal should be covered by analog. Uh, Amarnath, if you think I'm overshooting my time, just let me know. I'll stop immediately. So yes, this is how... Two, three minutes. Yeah. yeah. So this is how we cover our uh, basal bolus regimen with analogs. So you have a basal at the bottom. It could be glargine or detimir or degludec for breakfast, one of the uh, analogs for lunch and then dinner. And they exactly cover what is taken in the meal. This is the split mix regime where you, we combine an NPH, which acts, which peaks at around four hours and works for about 14 to 16 hours. And then the regular ag insulin, which works for six to eight hours. So we combine both of them and take it in the same syringe. 40 units per ml, the cost is extremely low. The family can afford it easily. And that's why we prefer this in very poor families so that we don't strain the resources. If you strain the resources, they will stop treatment. So what do we do? We combine both and we tell families, if you take regular insulin first, it is always regular first. And you cannot push the air back or you push the fluid back because you will be mixing the insulin. These are simple things that you have to remember. Because even the insulin in the needle and the hub would matter and, and uh, act on altering the blood sugar. So remember, if you're taking a regular first, it's always regular. So regular and NPH in the break, just before breakfast, and then we give a 5.30 dinner because, again, we finish our action of regular insulin by about 12 midnight. So they don't have a low in the middle of the night. This regular and NPH, this peak will be over by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. So you don't have a low in the middle of the night. That's why the evening dose is given at 5.30. So insulin is given 30 minutes before food at 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. Breakfast at 7.30 a.m., you give a mid-morning snack. You can have a bit of carbs here. The lunch will be lesser carbs, but we don't have a mid-afternoon snack. So when they come back from school, they can have dinner and a night snack at 8.30 p.m. So conventional in insulin dosing, you start two-thirds NPH, so two-third, one-third rule. Two-third NPH and one-third short-acting regular insulin. Before two-thirds, one-third. Two-third in the morning because of your insulin resistance due to counter-regulatory hormones in the morning. So two-third in the morning and one-third in the evening. This is only for starting. After that, your guide to therapy will be based on blood sugars. Fasting sugars, you should always tell them what the targets are. 80 to 120 for fasting and 100 to 160 or 120 to 160 for post meal. We try to give a little bit leeway for younger children and we even accept it up to 180 and sometimes even 200 in the middle of the night. So This is how a split mix regime is there. But you can remember, you can have a basal bolus regimen even in split mix regime. You give NPH and regular here, NPH and regular here, but you also give a regular alone for lunch because if they want to have a good carb meal, you can give, but then you will have to give an afternoon snack. 
So I'm not sure if you want me to continue here. I'll probably finish with this point. Insulin carb ratio. So if you have this 500 as a fixed number, you calculate the total daily dose to achieve a reasonable amount of control. So if you're giving 50 units per day, divide 500 by 50. So that is 10 grams is your insulin carb ratio. So one unit of insulin will cover 10 grams of carbs. What is insulin sensitivity index? So if your daily dose is 50 units, 1,800 is a fixed number by 50. So that is 36. So one unit of insulin will reduce pre-meal sugar by 36 milligram per cent. So this is will help you also calculate the correcting doses for um, uh, high blood sugars. And it's very useful in pump therapy also. I think I'll stop with there. If you want, uh, I can do it later, some other time or something like that. So should not be frozen is the most important point. Never more than 30 degrees centigrade. Direct exposure to sunlight will reduce efficacy. Needle should be removed for, before storage because it can leak. Unused cartilages and vials should be refrigerated without free, uh, freezing. We also talk about uh, only 30 days we ask them to change cartridges. But then if some families can't afford, for, for deglutex, sometimes we say up to 60 days. For glargine, about up to 40, 45 days. And regular, whenever your blood sugars are going high, then we realize that it's not working and we change the cartridge. I think I'll stop with there. If you uh, want me to continue, I'll do. Otherwise, I'll stop. Just one, any photos you show, madam. Okay. So this is how, this is one of my patients who was kind enough to allow me to draw on her abdomen. So this is the uh, subcostal margin. So I prefer abdomen in most children. So we, uh, uh, we do uh, one shot here and one pen gap is the second dose, another dose and another dose. So that's Sunday and one pen gap. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So this is one week. The other side of the abdomen is second week. So this is how uh, the distance between the doses is kept. And we all, please remember, we always hold. We always pinch. It's important to pinch in children and do it at 45 degrees. 90 degrees is for older people and heavier people. For children, the recommendation is 45 degree. Pen needle, 4 mm is good enough. It's painless and it's very uh, good. So this is how we do. And then we do the gluteal region too. For glargine, I prefer the gluteal region because the pH is 4. There's a stinging sensation and children don't like it. So for glargine, I prefer the gluteal region. But this is 1, 2, 3 and 4. And thigh is another area which we use in uh, a bit older children. We don't use arms, I think, almost ever in children. If you inject in the same site again and again, you will have lipohypertrophy and people will think this boy was exercising to lose his tummy, but he actually had lipohypertrophy. Washing and drying of hands prior to insulin handling. Wash with soap and water. We don't use spirit as much as possible. Sometimes you may need, uh, 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 we count to five for syringes. One, two, three, four and five. For the pens, it's up to 20 counts so that all the insulin is delivered. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at Thank you very much, madam. Uh, giving injection is also an OSCE station. So you have covered to the maximum. Just uh, last one question from my side. Mm -hmm. uh, before sending the patient to the school, what instructions you want? One. What? Sending the patient to the school, mm. child, <clears throat> instructions what you want to give. Okay, so we actually, because all of them, most of them are on basal bolus regimen. If the mother can travel, we tell them to take the insulin and go. Otherwise, uh, the uh, child will carry it in a, we just ask them to wrap it in a dark towel and keep it in the uh, staff cupboard, which is not very hot or near the sun. And they also carry an emergency kit bag, which is kept with the teacher. They have a glucometer in that, a few strips, a bottle of juice, and then uh, uh, some, if they have glucagon, they take glucagon if the teacher knows. Otherwise, we just give them uh, some glucose powder in a sachet and then uh, uh, some snacks also. If they have a low, they check and they also have an emergency number in that box. So the teacher gets everything together so that they help. Some of these schools have nurses, but some of still, even now we have difficulty because some schools don't accept these children. So till they are about eight years of age, the parents go and give. After that, we transition the child and teach the child how to check blood sugars and take their insulin themselves. 
Dr. Reshma is asking question. Uh, if the requirement of land is below ten units, you want to split into two times? No, I continue only with once because I give it only at night and I cover by regular insulin early in the evening. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, it was a fantastic lecture and very much useful for all the uh, residents. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll just uh, stop sharing one minute. Thank you so much for the opportunity and I wish all the students all the best. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, uh, here we are four students of Dr. Agupati, sir. Ayla, madam, uh, Riyad, sir, me and now Lynette. So four generations together along with Ragupati sir in same lecture. Thank you very much. So over to Dr. Riyad, sir. So I request Riyad, sir, to start just a 30 seconds about your the... Uh, the MISTI application and also the Mithai program. Just 30 seconds. They can, it can be asked in OSCE also. Sir, please. Okay. Thank you, uh, Amarnath and uh, team ISPE headed by Shaila Madam and uh, Ganesh uh, for giving this uh, excellent opportunity. And I'm so happy um, to be um, with uh, uh, my uh, Guru Regupadi sir. And uh, after the lecture of uh, um, Dr. Andrag and uh, uh, Dr. Ahila, I think it is uh, very easy to answer all these OSCE questions because everything which I'm going to show in these slides are already uh, discussed. And uh, regarding this uh, Mitai program, Mitai program is actually a comprehensive uh, uh, diabetic care program implemented by the government of Kerala through the um, social security mission where all children with type 1 diabetes below the age of 18 are provided with uh, insulins um, and also the other consumables. That includes insulin pens, glucose strips, um, uh, ketone strips, and uh, lancets. And also every three months, uh, we provide them an opportunity to do a uh, continuous glucose monitoring. And those children who are having brittle diabetes, who are really uh, indicated, uh, we can provide insulin pumps also. Uh, I think uh, um, sooner or later this will come in other states also. In Karnataka, um, uh, I am aware that Tegupati sir and uh, Dr. Vani is uh, trying to uh, make it uh, um, into practice with the government. Thank you. So Thank I'm you very much, sir. Uh, just uh, one second. Uh, I request all the participants to be active in this OSCE session. You are supposed to answer in your chat box. We'll be giving 30 seconds time after each question so that everyone can answer and everyone will get the equal chance. Yes. Okay. I think uh, the slides are visible now. Visible, okay. sir. Okay. Audible only. Okay. Yes. So I shall start with this uh, video station because we know for DNB Oski there could be some video stations also. <laughs> So these are the questions. Identify the condition, name the type of breathing. You can describe the breathing pattern and uh, four causes for the same and name for investigations to clinch the diagnosis. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Amarnath will be keeping a watch on the chat box. Yes, sir. Most of them, they uh, answer Kushman uh, breathing. Diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, but nobody described about the what is too small breathing. You can do that. Uh, four causes no one has written till now. So once you are uh, telling time is up, I will. Shallow breathing, yeah. We are giving 30 seconds, sir. I'm saying. Okay. Nobody described. Yeah, rapid, shallow breathing. Yes. So uh, we know that the, this is an acidotic breathing uh, because it is very important to identify acidotic breathing because uh, when a small uh, baby is brought with uh, diabetes, we know that uh, type of diabetes can happen in very young babies also. Sometimes um, even it can happen uh, before the age of six months when we call it neonatal diabetes. So very easily the child can be misunderstood as a case of bronchiolitis or bronchopneumonia and uh, the treatment that is the uh, fluid management as well as insulin may get delayed. So 
uh, we have to see the pattern of the breathing. If it is a, a respiratory distress, if respiratory distress is associated with a, um, a tachypnea, then it is more of a parenchymal issue or sometimes even for uh, bronchial asthma it can happen. But when it is um, a silent tachypnea, that is, it is a deep sighing type of uh, respiration without any increased work of breathing, that is, without any lower chest in drawing, then it is acidotic breathing. So all of us should be able to identify or distinguish acidotic breathing from uh, uh, the uh, respiratory distress in a case of pneumonia. And uh, as we know, uh, this acidosis or acidotic breathing can also occur in other conditions like uh, uh, renal failure, salicylate poisoning, lactic acidosis, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, the investigation, we will definitely do a, a blood gas uh, we should uh, also look for uh, other causes you know, by doing lactate uh, and creatinine and also ketones. Actually, uh, the first investigation or the bedside test we can, we can, which we can do is uh, just doing a urine ketone. Because whenever a child comes to us with a, um, um, an emergency, most of the time we do catheterize and you take a fresh sample of uh, uh, urine and do a urine ketone. If you are having the luxury of having a blood ketone, it is uh, it will be better than a urine ketone. So the Just next one second, sir. Uh, yes, one please. One point of addition: uh, the OSCE can they can ask about the neonatal diabetes below six months of age. Whenever it is diagnosed, please do genetic testing. Right. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. So coming to the station two. Uh, 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 I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, because uh, we have a habit of uh, sending urine ketones to the lab, which we should stop uh, after this class. Urine ketone strips should be available uh, in the bedside in our ICU or in the emergency, and uh, it should be done then and there because uh, the, the, there is a question, the third question, how much after how much time you will read? That is the most important thing. If you are sending it to the lab, you won't get a proper report. So you can see those questions and uh, try to answer in the chat box. Someone has said 10 seconds, 30 seconds. During strip, 30 seconds. One second, 20 seconds. One second, 40 seconds. So okay. of positive test, no one has written. What is the cause? Yes. What is the principle? Beta hydroxybutyrate, urine ketone test kit. Beta hydroxybutyrate in blood. Yes. yes. Value so, three so, millimoles. Yeah. Everyone. Can, uh, yeah, just uh, look at the legend given here also because uh, uh, when um, it is more than one point five millimoles per liter. <clears throat> Um, yeah. uh, uh, but but uh, according to his pad, uh, it is uh, more than 3 millimoles. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Like uh, any value of uh, more than 1.5 millimoles per liter, actually, you should be uh, suspicious because this child can go in for a decay at any time. So, answers for the question um, this is, uh, these are actually urine ketone strips, and uh, the reaction is based on the sodium nitroprusside test. And uh, you have to read uh, 40 seconds after the dip. That is very, very important. You can just uh, uh, dip the uh, strip into the urine and uh, uh, take it out. Uh, just it is a one second dip. And uh, uh, after that, you wait for 40 seconds and look at the color. So um, uh, you can just remember it's a deep brown color. That means ketones are large. And uh, most of the time, child will be going for a, a ketosis. And um, uh, well, the hypoglycemia, the, uh, I don't know, the, the question was uh, uh, about uh, decay definition and also hyperketotic hypoglycemia also uh, uh, can occur. What are the causes of uh, uh, positive ketone strip test? Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so this uh, hyperketotic hypoglycemia in conditions like GSD, uh, then hypoglycemia in cases of hyperpituitarism, some IEMs, then gluconeogenesis disorders as well as DK. And in uh, bl blood uh, ketone estimation, we measure beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, which is a more uh, dynamic uh, test because uh, the, in the urine, we usually measure more of acetoacetate and it can it will stay for a long time. 
so it is the urine ketone strips are useful for the initial diagnosis for the initial diagnosis that is enough uh, but um, uh, to look for the improvement whether the ketone is coming down urine ketone strips doesn't help at all because it will remain positive for a very long time but uh, if you can measure the uh, blood ketone uh, levels then it will also give you an idea whether the ketosis is improving or not and uh, as amarnath has rightly pointed out the cutoff for uh, uh, ketones is actually the for decade is 3 millimoles per liter thank you very much sir just for summarization we request all the <coughs> advanced icu center both nicu and psu should start using the blood ketone meter which is very cheap the each ketone strip cost around 125 rupees only and uh, blood ketone meter can replace the abg also Hmm. and nobody answered the second uh, answer all of you know sodium nitroprusside reaction that is a cause for urine strip test urine ketone strip should should be used in uh, primary health center remote setting because it will take 12 to 48 hours to recover from the urine even though from blood uh, it disappears can anyone tell what urine ketones will uh, show what ketones are seen with the urine strip what it measures blood you said beta hydroxybutyrate very good acetone mainly acetone and acetoacetate thank you very much sir please go ahead okay and um, uh, there is an instrument uh, from hemacube which will which can measure both the hemoglobin as well as uh, uh, blood ketone levels actually the company people will give the uh, meter free to the icu if any hospital which is having an icu and uh, we can start doing it in emergency cases thank you then uh, um, this is a, a case scenario where a 7 year old girl presents to the er with severe pain abdomen respiratory distress uh, and uh, which is there for one or two days and her mother reports she has grown thin that is weight is um, uh, she is losing weight even though the child is uh, eating quite well and drinking a lot of water there has not been any cough or respiratory symptoms otherwise so uh, she also tells that uh, the child had started uh, bed bedding again so everything uh, is actually a tell tale evidence of uh, um, uh, you know what it is um, so now the uh, now the child is lethargic has sunken eyes and has a deep fast breathing pattern weight is 20 kg and uh, her abdomen is soft and chest is clear uh, but uh, she is having a tachypnea and the drps reading is 520 i am very sure the all the uh, pediatric residents here should have seen such a child and there won't be any um, uh, miss in making the diagnosis they are writing 200 ml nh blood gas most important blood gas so we know it is dk and uh, as the child is having uh, this borderline bp it will be good that you give a uh, bolus uh, a, a bolus is not uh, um, needed in all cases of dk that also we should remember um, uh, the uh, how to identify uh, severe uh, dehydration and uh, some dehydration is al- already been described by both uh, uh, dr andrag as well as uh, dr ahila and um, uh, the most important thing is when you are rehydrating the child it should be slow so uh, even though there are um, new evidences which are coming the rate of dehydration or the fluid we uh, use um, uh, doesn't uh, make much difference in the outcome it is always better to um, uh, um, correct the acidosis slowly rather than fast and uh, with uh, um, uh, the fluid should be added with uh, 20 mg per liter of uh, potassium uh, if the potassium is normal and uh, we will have um, uh, to increase the uh, potassium the amount of potassium uh, when we get a, a value of the potassium because in the, at the at the time of starting therapy uh, we uh, may not know how much potassium to add so to start with we can add either 20 or even 40 will be fine Uh, but if uh, you find that there is hypokalemia you can increase it to 60 or if there is hyper you can decrease it to 20 that will be uh, the best way to do and uh, blood gas we know we have to uh, do so that we can 
uh, assess the severity of acidosis because uh, according to the blood gas by looking at the pH and bicarb we divide uh, decay into mild, moderate and severe. Uh, when the pH is less than 7.1 it is uh, severe, um, uh, between 7.1 and 2 it is um, uh, uh, moderate and uh, uh, more than 7.2 take it mild. Why it is important is because um, we can manage so at least some cases of mild decay in the ward so that we can avoid an ICU admission. And um, uh, bicarb also, the range is um, uh, less than 5, 5 to 10, and uh, 10 to 15. And uh, always, as all the speakers were telling, we should be uh, in the lookout for cerebral edema, uh, which is the most lethal complication uh, of uh, um, DK. The, most of the children who die during the management of uh, DK die because of cerebral edema only. So always be um, uh, concerned about uh, increased amount of fluid as well as a rapid correction of uh, hyperglycemia. Thank you. Yeah. Can anyone can uh, message what uh, ABG parameter you want to look for the cerebral edema? As Anurag sir was mentioning. Anyone? Sorry. Can start. Yeah, very good. CO2, PCO2, very good. PCO2 less than 10. Yes, okay. go ahead, sir. Thanks. Yes. And uh, if you if, uh, if somebody suspects cerebral edema, what imaging you will do before uh, starting treatment? Yes, answer. Can I anything? CT, CT scan that thing. Uh, so, so the one important message is never uh, shift the patient for a CT scan. If you are clinically suspecting cerebral edema, the first thing you have to do is you reduce the fluid by one third. Um, and uh, if uh, the child is having um, no hypotension or low BP, you have to start manitol then and there because uh, there is no need of shifting the child for CT uh, scan at that time because that will just deteriorate the child. Okay. So... The next uh, uh, question, next station is name two common types of insulin regimen that are used in individuals with type 1 diabetes and name uh, any two insulin used in these regimens. And uh, what is the, com uh, the chart, the insulin dose plan for a 20 kg child with type 1 diabetes according to both regimens? And what is the commonest side effect of insulin? Basal bolus and fitness, they have answered. Okay. <laughs> Nobody answering the name of the insulin. Regular insulin. Name of the insulin, no one is writing. Okay. So uh, there are and there are two methods. This was already explained by uh, Ahila Madam. Uh, you can see that this is called a split mix regimen. Split mix means um, uh, here, uh, you are actually making the mix. Uh, I have written in small letters, fixed mix. This fixed mix is the one uh, which is otherwise called the premix, uh, where you have no liberty in changing the proportion of the insulins, the short-acting and the long-acting insulins. Uh, like you get uh, insulins like 50-50, um, uh, uh, 30-70, 80-20, something like that. So all these are not suited for managing children with type 1 diabetes because uh, they eat different meals at different times and it is not uh, suitable for managing type 1 diabetes in children. So in split mix, what we do is uh, we decide according to the uh, child's weight, eating pattern, the sugar values or the glucose logbooks which the child is maintaining and we decide how much uh, short-acting insulin or long-acting insulin to be used. The only thing is we mix both the insulins in one syringe, that is the short acting and uh, intermediate or long acting insulin. And we give it two times a day. Two times a day means um, um, in the morning before the breakfast and also um, uh, in the evening before the dinner. And we assume that the long acting component, which is given along with the um, uh, morning dose of uh, split mix will cover the lunch. Uh, uh, lunch time also or the lunch hyperglycemia also and remember that this is an imperfect method of uh, managing type 1 diabetes 
but in resource limited settings or if uh, you, the uh, we cannot afford or we cannot uh, convince the parents enough for a uh, basal bolus uh, this is used sometimes but uh, my humble request is all of us should uh, tell the parents the children with type 1 diabetes needs more number of pricks and at least uh, three times insulin three doses of insulin is necessary for their proper uh, proper survival and this is what is called uh, uh, this uh, multiple daily injections or basal bolus regimen where you can actually you, you actually give uh, three doses of insulin with uh, all the major meals that is before breakfast before lunch and before dinner along with the uh, one or two doses of uh, basal insulin so here it is written um, uh, this is aspart or lispro uh, or glulisin as the bolus insulins uh, before each meal along with glargin as the basal insulin uh, we can actually do the same by using your regular insulin and nbh also if the uh, parents cannot afford uh, here what we do is we uh, like in split mix we give uh, a combination of regular insulin and nbh insulin in the um, uh, before the breakfast uh, a dose of regular insulin before the lunch and also again a mix of uh, regular insulin and nbh insulin before the dinner so the child gets three doses of insulin and these two doses of uh, nbh will act as the basal component so bas the basal bolus regimen doesn't mean you have to use the um, uh, costly fashionable insulin all the time it only means each meal is covered by a particular dose of insulin so we can even do that by using a regular insulin and the nbh combination and uh, for children who are at school uh, i will tell you there will be a practical problem because uh, we know that there should be a time lag between the insulin and meal uh, when we are using a regular insulin so in most of uh, our children what we do is uh, they will use a regular insulin with nbh insulin in the morning as well as in for the dinner because both these doses are taken at home they can have ample time for waiting after the insulin like 20 to 30 minutes but for the lunch at the school recess as the time is very less we actually advise them to take a short acting analog where the child can eat just after the insulin so another method even the pump is uh, 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 intensified multiple daily um, uh, with a continuous infusion of insulin so that is another way and always remember insulin is given ahead of food this they, these are uh, this uh, short acting insulin should be given ahead of insulin and uh, we now have some insulins which are uh, ultra short acting like uh, um, uh, feaspandol that is fast acting aspart where the insulin can be given along with food this is important why this uh, short acting analogs as well as ultra short acting analogs are important is because in very small children and uh, toddlers and all they will be very fussy so if you are giving a regular insulin dose and after that if the child just refuses to take the meal the child will go for hypoglycemia so in such children it is always better to use a ultra short acting or a short acting analog at least because this can be given in between the meals uh, or just after the meals so that you get a better control and you can avoid hypoglycemia and uh, all of us should by heart this chart which is given in nelson and we should be knowing uh, something about these types of insulin which are the uh, rapid acting analogs there are three rapid acting analogs in use aspart glulisin and lispro of which aspart and lispro are the ones which we use most commonly and um, as pediatricians pediatricians we should be uh, familiar with at least a few brands uh, uh, with uh, these medicines and we have regular insulin which is short acting and we also have this intermediate acting insulin which is the nbh insulin the other ones the semi and uh, the things like that are not available in the market so we actually have rapid acting analogs namely aspart glulisin and lispro we have regular insulin which is a short acting insulin we have nbh insulin which is a intermediate acting insulin and we have basal long acting analogs namely glargin detima 
and also deglutac. And uh, regarding hypoglycemia, it is very important to teach the parents to identify the symptoms before discharge uh, at the time of diagnosis itself. Because once the child develops a hypoglycemia, severe hypoglycemic seizure, the parent won't be confident enough to optimize the insulin treatment after that. They will always remember the seizure which the child had developed after giving insulin. So such parents will always keep their children in a hyperglycemic range. So hypoglycemia should be prevented. So you have to teach them about uh, how to adjust the doses and also tell them the symptoms. The symptoms can vary from trauma. It can, uh, the, there can be some amount of uh, um, uh, difficulty in speaking. The child may become irritable. Uh, the child may be behaving in an awkward manner. Uh, the child will have uh, palpitation, child can have sweating, uh, sometimes the child can have uh, unconsciousness as well as uh, seizures. And uh, if possible, in the event of hypoglycemia, uh, do a GRPS. That is why this glucometer should be in the uh, school bag. And we should tell the uh, bus driver as well as the school teacher as well as or not to uh, uh, the uh, friends of the close friends of the child that child is having diabetes and child is taking insulin. The best thing will be uh, having a ID card uh, with a uh, tag. So what to do with instructions about what to do if the child develops a hypoglycemia. So whenever the GR base is less than 70, we call it hypoglycemia in a diabetic kid. We know that the cutoffs are different in other children. And uh, it should be treated with uh, 15 grams of sugar mixed in water, or we can use 15 gram glucose tablets. And um, uh, actually we should not advise the child to uh, take chocolates or something like that, because that will take some time before uh, uh, the glucose level becomes normal. So it can uh, cause uh, neuroglycopenia and the severe symptoms can occur. And always, check the sugars after 20 to 30 minutes and make sure that the blood sugar has normalized. And also the immediate treatment of uh, hypoglycemia by giving simple sugar should be followed by a snack. Then only the sugar level can be maintained later. Okay. Amarnath, do you want to add anything to this? No, sir, nothing. Excellent. Okay, okay. okay. Then um, uh, I think all of you can answer this, how to match. So the... if they ask what is the injection should be given for hypoglycemia, you can type. Yes, what anyone, injection anyone you want? Which, uh, is there any injection which the child can keep along with the glucometer? Yeah, someone answered glucagon. Yes, glucagon. So glucagon injections can be um, um, taken in severe cases of hypoglycemia, especially in children. Uh, who are um, uh, getting severe hypoglycemia and those who are having hyperglycemia unawareness as well as thoughtless. Okay. So are they matching this? Yeah, all of you match. Degludac very long acting. Someone after one B. Lorgin long acting. Hypopen. Okay, all these were discussed before. Yeah. Yes, so, so these are the answers. Degludec is very long acting. Human Actrapid is a short acting soluble insulin. Glargin is a long acting insulin. Human Insulator or Isophen or NPH insulin is an intermediate acting insulin. And uh, Aspart, Glulicin as well as Lispro are rapid acting insulin. We also have an ultra rapid acting insulin called uh, uh, Fiasper is fast acting as part. Can anyone answer ultra long acting insulins? Uh, there are two now, newer insulins. They, this question was asked in theory. Yes, anyone who knows they can answer? So, one is Decludex, second one is Tugio. Large in U300 is called Tugio, and Decludex is called Reciba. It can act up to 42 hours, 36 to 42 hours. Detimer also long act. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. So coming to the next station.
uh, hemoglobin A1C, what does this testing indicate? We know that uh, we periodically ask children to do hemoglobin A1C who are on treatment for type 1 diabetes. And um, uh, if uh, we are, uh, there is a first question, what does this testing indicate? Second question is, uh, what is the cutoff to suspect diabetes? This is in a naive patient. Uh, if you are just doing a hemoglobin A1C, can you just diagnose diabetes as such, like we are doing a- Someone has written 5.7, someone written 6. The question number one, another question is missing. How much duration it tells the glycemic control? The question number one, some part is missing. That also you can answer. Yeah, someone has written 6.5 cutoff. Last three months, very good. Desirable HbA1c in 8 year old child. No one answered. And uh, any condition where hemoglobin A1c values may not be very reliable in monitoring. Yeah, important. Some hematological condition. Yes. Hemolytic anemia. With organomegaly, no? Organomegaly was discussed before. Yeah. So, uh, hemoglobin A1C signifies sugar control mm -hmm. over last three months. And uh, hemoglobin A1C of uh, more than 6.5 is diabetes, provided is the patient or the child is having uh, classical symptoms of diabetes, namely uh, the polyuria, weight loss, uh, polydipsia and all. And if you are doing a hemoglobin A1C and you are getting a value of more than 6.5. And... Um, uh, the target in eight-year-old, the new SPAD guidelines tells us it is less than 7%. The um, uh, American Diabetic Federation puts it as 7.5%. Uh, but um, if you refer the Nelson textbook, it is given as 6.5 to 8 because they have given different cutoffs for different ages. 5 to 11 years, they have given 6.5 to 8. So whatever you say, you can also always uh, give the reference also. Yeah, one extra question, sir. Uh, in case of thalassemia, what you want to measure, not HPA1C, something else? What else you can measure? Yeah. You can message. They ask the question. Even in neonates also, we do sometimes. Someone wrote the peptide. Similar to hemoglobin, A1C, what are the other? Uh, Fructosamine, very good. Okay. Okay, good. Good. So, uh, this is a child on follow up after um, diagnosis and after managing the initial days. So, these are the GRBS records of a child with type 1 diabetes who is taking insulin as follows uh, NBH at 12, 12 units at 7 a.m., 9 units at 8 p.m., 4 units before breakfast, 5 units before lunch, and 4 units before dinner. I want uh, all of you to name this regimen also. What is this regimen called? That is um, two doses of basal with uh, um, um, two, two doses of intermediate insulin with uh, four doses of uh, short act, uh, three doses of short acting insulin. And uh, when you look at the uh, values, we can see that uh, some values are not acceptable. There are um, hypoglycemia, persistent hypoglycemia, CMS, and all the three days. So, what dose modification do you wish to make for this child? Someone has written so much I effect. Fit mix regime. Most of them written fit mix regime. So, as I as I, as I told you, whenever you see that. Uh, I, the, someone is using regular and NBH insulin, don't think it is always split mix regime. This is again basal bolus because all the three meals, that is breakfast, lunch and dinner, all the three major meals are covered by an insulin. And uh, uh, there are two NBH insulin which are given for the basal action. So this is again basal bolus regimen, not split mix. Split mix means only two doses in a day. Someone has written reduce the NBH dosage of night. So we'll go to the answer. The correct answer is to decrease the night NBH so that the somagi phenomenon is corrected. So what is dawn phenomenon and what is somagi phenomenon? Dawn phenomenon means the nighttime insulin is inadequate or there is a heavy carbohydrate rich dinner so that the 3 a.m. values if we check will be increased and it will remain high when we check the 8 a.m. fasting sugars. 
and can anyone say why the there is a uh, increase in sugars um, at 3 am or 4 am like that early morning increase in sugars are due to dr ayla discussed already common written growth hormone counter regulatory hormone yes it's very good very good because of the rise in the counter regulatory hormones during that time so if um, uh, you are uh, identifying it is a dawn phenomenon how can you identify the dawn phenomenon by just looking at the 3 am value if the 3 am values are high as well as the morning values are high you call it dawn phenomenon and the remedy is to increase the nighttime nbh or nighttime basal insulin um, uh, so that uh, the uh, hyperglycemia is corrected or you decrease the night carbohydrate uh, intake. So Maggie phenomenon means the nighttime insulin was excess or food was inadequate. Hence the patient went in for hypoglycemia in the early morning and the counter regulatory hormones after that, after that hypoglycemia has pushed the morning sugars to high. So here the remedy is actually to decrease the nighttime insulin or increase the carb intake at night. So it is very important uh, to uh, look at the 3 a.m. values uh, at least uh, uh, once or twice in a week so that we know we, we, we can identify between Dawn and Somagi because the management is entirely different in each of these cases. So that is the importance of that particular question. One extra question from my side. Please. Uh, can anyone write in insulin syringe what, how many units per ml uh, insulin is available and in pen insulin how much units per ml so someone has written 40 yeah. iu per ml syringe okay in pen yeah pen 100 correct so uh, syringe both are av available 40 IU per ml and 100. 40 is red color, 100 is black color syringe. Okay. Pen only single that is 100 IU per ml. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. So, so, uh, so the, the importance is when you are using a 40 unit per uh, uh, ml of insulin, the pen should be 40 unit per ml. And um, when you are using an insulin which is 100 unit per ml, the pen should be matching to that. So please check that. Otherwise, we will land up in trouble because the child can develop severe hypoglycemia because of the um, wrong doses. And um, uh, regarding uh, targets, um, there is a question, what is the pre-meal, post-meal and pre-bed targets? Uh, different societies give uh, different uh, targets actually. but. Uh, uh, most of us take the SPAD as the um, uh, standard and for the pre-meal it is 70 to 130 milligram per uh, deciliter. For post-meal it is 90 to 180 and for pre bed it is 80 to 140. But I have uh, just uh, made a footnote also, uh, even in United States, um, only 22 to 23 percent of children below the age of 12 years and uh, 17 percent of children between 13 to 17 years of age with type 1 diabetes scared by endocrinologists met the prior target of uh, less than 7.5. So uh, even though the targets are uh, kept very stringent uh, in the practical uh, world, uh, it is very difficult to attain this. So for that, we need to uh, have a holistic approach to the family. Uh, so uh, because insulin is not the wonder drug, we need all the four pillars, namely the insulin, the diet management, as well as the exercise, as well as proper charting. Uh, we have new tools for charting, like uh, um, uh, the continuous glucose monitoring, where we also look into the time in range concept and all, and also carbohydrate counting, all those things will help. And the next station is uh, regarding counseling. A child with a type 1 diabetes gets vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and tummy pains. Uh, what will you counsel the family regarding home management, regarding monitoring, diet, insulin dose, when to seek? Because you should all remember uh, the child who had been diagnosed with diabetes on treatment will land up with DK in your hospital only because of two reasons. One is either the child has become sick due to some other illness or the child had stopped insulin or child had missed the doses of insulin at least for one day or 
uh, more than well, one or two days. So if you teach them properly how to manage a sick day, that itself will bring down the repeat admissions with the DK. So that is the importance. Yeah, Dr. Swati or Dr. Marin Joseph, anyone can answer this counseling session. If someone can um, uh, just unmute and talk, that will also be good because uh, it is a, it, uh, there will be a lot to write in the chat box. No? Yeah. Dr. Swati or Dr. Marin Joseph, anyone can. Or in, even Lynette can. So most of them have written parental education. Okay, so you have to write down, write down and give a uh, copy of uh, sick day manager. It should be a written plan. It should not be like a, uh, just um, uh, some advice. So actually we can, uh, uh, the, the most important thing is we should tell them on all sick days, you have to check for ketones, either the blood ketones or urine poi ketones, whatever is available with them. And also the blood sugars, like in any monitoring day, because we know that uh, there are some monitoring days and some non-monitoring days for uh, all children who are uh, on treatment with the diabetes, uh, so on treatment with insulin. So all sick days are monitoring days. We may have to do multiple uh, monitoring, like uh, before food and after food and like that. And um, uh, always tell the mother, because um, the, mom, the parents will think that during the illness or during a fever or a fever vomiting something, the child is not taking enough food. So we can either skip the insulin dose or we can reduce the dose. But that doesn't happen. Uh, that doesn't happen. What happens is because of the illness, there is a lot of counter regulatory hormones coming out and which will push your sugars high. So the child will be having mostly hyperglycemia rather than hypoglycemia. So no skipping of insulin during those days. You have to carefully monitor the blood glucose level and according to the blood glucose level, as well as the presence of urine ketones, so if you have a blood ketones, we may have to give some supplementary doses of insulin. And uh, this actually, this chart tells us uh, how to guide on the supplementary doses of insulin during the monitor. And uh, when to come to the hospital, that is also important. When they are managing and they are seeing that the ketones are uh, large and the child is having some symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis, like uh, um, abdominal pain, severe vomiting, the child is not able to um, um, take his food, all those things. All those th tells us that the child should be taken to the hospital. And uh, we, when we uh, teach them the home management of a sick day, we should also uh, make sure that the mother or the uh, parent know when to take the child to the hospital also. So next is, um, this is about a 10 year old boy who has come to you for his vaccination. And uh, you have identified that the child is having, uh, uh, the weight is more and uh, um, the lifestyle is, um, uh, a little fussy, all those things, and the child is having acanthosis. So one important message is when a child comes for um, immunization or some other mild illness, you are also supposed to look at the weight and height of the child because growth monitoring is a very important responsibility of a pediatrician. And you have to chart it on a growth chart and you have to identify which child needs intervention regarding his or her growth also. It is not just treating the illness. You have to look at the growth and uh, whether the child is growing adequately or whether uh, the child is gaining weight more than what is needed, all those things you have to find out and then you have to manage that also. So what all you will look in the history, investigation, management and um, an account of um, BMA Sendales also. Anybody has written anything, Amarna? Everybody has written uh, insulin resistance, insulin resistance, insulin resistance. Okay, okay. Okay, so 
uh, in such a child you have to ask for any child who is uh, coming to you with overweight or obesity you have to ask for the birth history uh, whether the child was an sga because we know that when an sga child becomes overweight and obese they are more prone for getting adult onset uh, uh, lifestyle diseases and the complications so you have to look for family history of obesity somebody in the family is obese that means there is more chance the child will uh, develop other comorbidities sooner and also look for some intellectual disability visual problems development delay because all those are points regarding uh, points uh, towards a syndromic cause of obesity and also drug history especially steroids and antiepileptics and uh, sometimes some antidepressants and also take a proper diet history and daily activities you should actually ask the um, mother to um, uh, take a recall history of the diet as well as an activity report when the child is coming for the next visit and measure properly the weight height as well as the bmi on the chart and management here if it is an exogenous obesity uh, the more than the pharmacological management here it is uh, the dietary advice and uh, daily exercise and uh, the dietary advice uh, we should actually discuss with the family just writing and giving a diet plan or a list of uh, uh, foods is not enough we have to sit down with the family and uh, get the help of a dietitian and plan a uh, what you call a weight reducing diet in case of uh, this child and then we have to monitor it uh, intensively as well as daily exercise should be started out and here the uh, basic mechanism of acanthosis is actually insulin resistance and um, uh, the, uh, there is some amount of uh, cellular growth which is intact and overgrowth of cells we have uh, in acanthosis nigricans and um, uh, regarding the bmi it is no in adults we actually have only two cutoffs uh, but for children we need to use a growth chart we need to use a bmi chart because uh, we cannot uh, take a absolute cutoff for a child the cutoff will depend upon what is the age of the child so you can use this uh, iap 2015 growth chart all our growth charts where you have this height and weight centiles on the other side of the chart we have uh, this bmi centiles also here you can see that after the 50th centile the, you, you cannot see any uh, 75th or 90th or uh, 95th centile or anything there are just two lines one is an orange line which tells us which is a 23 adult equivalent that means above that particular line the child is overweight <clears throat> and another red line where it is written 27 adult equivalent that is above this red the child is obese so we know the asians have these problems associated with obesity um, at an earlier bmi that is why uh, if you look at the books for uh, everyone else other than the asians the cutoffs are 25 and 30 but for us it is 23 and 27 so you have to plot the bmi each time when the child is coming and if you are seeing that the um, uh, the plotting is coming above this orange line or red line uh, the, uh, we have to diagnose overweight and obesity respectively and start acting on it so this is the last station the, this this adolescent uh, obese girl came with a uh, uh, neck hyperpigmentation. Uh, I think um, it is a very easy question. Everyone will identify what does it signif uh, signify and what are the components of metabolic syndrome and uh, is there any drug uh, which we can use in such condition. So, when you are answering diabetes mellitus, hypertension, obesity, acanthosis, nitricans, uh, obesity, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, most of them are answering. Okay. So, this is um, just about uh, the staging of acanthosis nigricans. Uh, this is for the uh, knowledge of the PGs. Uh, you actually stage it like stage one, two, three, and four. Um, uh, the one means uh, it is uh, present only on close uh, visual inspection and stage two means it is limited to the base of the skull it is seen only um, over the back and the moderate meat is extending to the lateral margins of the neck and the severe means uh, you can see acanthosis even uh, from the front of the neck so 
these are just for your information there is a staging for acanthosis nigricans and uh, you know this is acanthosis nigricans which signifies insulin resistance and um, you know, metabolic syndrome and how do you diagnose metabolic syndrome in children uh, there are different cutoffs which are given for uh, uh, triglycerides uh, fasting glucose blood pressure weight circumference um, and uh, all these um, when coming together that is if the if there is a high base circumference along with two other criteria you diagnose metabolic syndrome and uh, Vaman Kadrikar Sarhan team has already published weight uh, base circumference cutoffs for Indian children and regarding the use of drug uh, never ever say that uh, the, there is a wonder drug for overweight obesity and insulin resistance the actual drug is always lifestyle management you have to do dietary modifications as well as proper exercise and um, uh, for children who are doing that uh, if uh, you are seeing telltale evidences of insulin resistance we can try metformin metformin can just uh, act, act as a uh, adjuvant rather than a drug so that is how you have to look at it so with that i'm yeah, thank you very much sir uh, dr yes sir two extra question from my side please uh, anyone can answer previously uh, we have discussed about this case child with diabetes with hypothyroidism alopecia and also uh, the uh, Mucocutaneous candidiasis. What is your diagnosis? Anyone can answer? Mucocutaneous candidiasis. Hyperpigmentation of the lips. Answer has come, actually. Yeah, very good. One more question. Uh, an obese girl coming to you with, uh, with uh, the diabetes, type 2 diabetes, you have done the ultrasound abdomen. What are the two findings you want to see? Obese adolescent girl with type 2 diabetes. One is PCOS. Second one. Fatty liver. Excellent. So you are all uh, very intelligent professors. Uh, we are very happy, very actively participating. Now we'll go to the last few minutes. Uh, uh, we first of all like to thank the known artists for this giving the chance to uh, sponsoring this session. We'll go to the the classification of the insulins and time in range will be passed. So We are able to see. Uh, we are grateful to Professor Raghupati sir. He is my teacher and mentor, one of the oldest pediatric endocrinologist of uh, India, and we can call father of pediatric endocrinology. When I was a student, we learnt a lot of lot of things, sir. So thank you very much, sir. It's presently senior consultant pediatric endocrinologist, professor, and chairman in changing diabetes in children. Uh, 22 centers in India, and he was, his major achievement was the best clinician award by the European Society of Pediatric Endocrinology 2018. We are very proud of you, sir. 
So now coming to the positioning of TIR in diabetes management and role of newer insulin. So we are thankful to the Novo team so for sponsoring this program and luckily uh, they have given me the chance to introduce Fiasp and Tesiba first time in children in India and uh, also in insulin pump. I was the first person to start Fiasp when he's in trial stage. Thank you very much. So concept of the time in range. Previously, HbA1c was most important, but at present, the most important is in time in range. In 24 hours, how much time child is having the normal range of sugar? That is to take from 70 to 180. So how much hypoglycemia, mild hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia, 50 to 70 mild and less than 50. So this is the very, very important concept they are asking you in the question. So last year, they have asked about the continuous glucose monitoring, HbA1c, newer insulin or insulin analogs, except regular insulin, all other insulin comes under the insulin analog, including NPH, Deglutec, Glargine, uh, the aspartate and glue lysine. So it refers to time spent in individual, the target glucose range, that is 70 to 180, but occasionally 70 to 140. The percentage of time spent in below range or above range indicates the hypo or hypo hyperglycine. So TIR may be used as an appropriate end point in clinical research and measure of glycemic control in patients with diabetes. Emerging evidence suggests that TIR is inversely correlated to risk of developing microvascular and macrovascular complications in patients with diabetes. It is just like this. Previously, we were using the pager. Now pager is outdated. Now then Nokia for mobile has come. Now Nokia is outdated. We want only Android or iPhone. Like that, HbA1c will be there, but the most advanced will be the time in range. Everyone will be talking time in range. How much time you are spending in normal range of sugars. That is the most important parameter to measure the long-term complications. What are the international consensus? We'll discuss over, about only type 1 diabetes here. That is 70 to 180. Little older means adolescent. More than 50% within 12 hours. Uh, and younger children, 70%. So coming to the, the hyperglycemia should be less than 5%. So little adolescent up to 10%. And the more than 180 to 250 up to 25%. Coming to the hypoglycemia, it should be less than 74% and less than 54, it should be less than 1%. And uh, just coming back to FIAS, we did not tell you the beautiful molecule. The advantage with FIAS is especially the children who are going to the school, they can take the shot and take the insulin within 20 minutes. So just two minutes prior to the food or 20 minutes after the food especially adolescent girls and teenage boys, they don't want to take in front of the other colleagues. So they can have food first. And within 20 minutes, they can have this faster acting, ultra short acting insulin. So, and very less incidence of hypoglycemia with PR. This we have covered. So correlation of between HbA1c and time in range. So, 100% correlation with 4.3% decline. So it is better to do TIR. So now all patients of type 1 diabetes ideally require they have to keep the continuous glucose monitoring and take the range of sugars, whether it is normal or not. One or two minutes we'll touch about it. The even continuous glucose monitoring also here. So significant association of uh, the time in range with the uh, media intimal media thickness so that is the atherosclerosis complication association between tir and the maximum <coughs> uh, the cardiac adverse events so it is very less when you use the timing frame so 10 year cumulative incidence of developing diabetes related complications after improving tir you see the complications in type 1 diabetes, the end stage renal disease, vision loss, amputation, myocardial. So, 
So better the TIR, lesser is the competition. Here three point two nine, which is two point two five. Here three point nine six, which is three point five six. So we have to increase the time in brain. Ideally, it should be eighty percent, but it's very difficult. In my patient, we are able to achieve up to fifty to sixty percent in almost seventy to eighty percent of patients who are using continuous glucose monitoring. So, uh, do newer insulin fare better? Just see. The half life, if you see, Degludec is only twenty five point four hours, the maximum duration. Glargin only twelve point one per. Plot flat time action profile in type one diabetes. Lower day to day variability, so almost four times lower if you take the Degludec. Similarly, day to day variability in Glargin three hundred versus Degludec two times less. So Degludec is better than even Glargin three hundred or Tujeo. The other name for Glargin three hundred is Tujeo. So consistently proven hypoglycemia benefit across this study. You are able to see always uh, Degludec. Is doing better than U three hundred. Again, consistently proven hypoglycemia benefit. Conclude trial showing the the it is better with the Degludec as a flat profile and lower risk of hypoglycemia. What about the time in range? So superiority of the insulin Degludec estimated treatment difference is significant. That is one point four three percent or twenty minutes. Per day in favor of Degludec, so glucose variability is very very less. So now HbA1c is replacing by the glucose variability and time in range and time above or below range. So time below range also you see it is very less with the Degludec compared to Glargin. So more portions achieve the significant uh, difference in TIR. So this is the CGM monitoring. You are able to see. The hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. This is a normal range, 70 to 150. They have kept here. So CGM profile with improved TIR. So complete TIR, that is time in range between Degludec and Glargin. It is better with the Degludec. That is 77.3. Significantly lower glucose variability has been seen with the Degludec. So two-year randomized control study shows the cardiovascular risk decreased 24 hours with Degludec. Summary: The time in range provides a closer view of person's glycemic status and aids in better glycemic control. Increase in time in range, so ideally we should keep 80 percent. So decrease the microvascular and macrovascular complications. International guidelines have now been updated, include consensus on CGM data. So compared to Glargin 100, Degludec has improved TIR and lower nocturnal hypoglycemia. Thank you. So we'll see. <clears throat> Any other doubts? Please, uh, I request you to ask the doubts, please. Once again, we thank you, uh, the Sonali, the sponsor from the Novo Nordisk, for giving this chance. So can anyone answer the microvascular and macrovascular complication? You can message here. We will see. Yes. Most of them you are all answering. So just a few slides. We'll go about the the continuous glucose monitoring. This question has been asked to you. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. 
here you are able to see the reader and the sensor so this is the reader this is the sensor this is 5 rupee coin like thing which will be attached to the arm and will be recording the blood sugar level every 5 minutes okay so this is a sensor you are able to see here so sensor kit package this you have to applicator you have to applicate and you have to do the application so this is the reader from which you can usb port you can take the all the readings okay so this is how you should record the cgm continuous glucose monitoring so here you are able to see the normal range 70 to 180 this is given in millimoles so even you can see the normal range when it is comes below it is shown as red color so check glucose review history it will show like this so high low your low you will be able to see as red color high you will be see as higher than like this so this is how you are continuous glucose monitoring question has been asked in the theory you can write about that so time in range already we have told 70 to 180 80 percent value should be normal 5 percent hypoglycemia allowed less than 70 and 1 percent below 54 of sugars so here in advanced glucometer you will be able to see the rising quickly the trend so rising glucose is rising changing slowly falling glucose falling quickly you will get the alarm so these are the advantages so glucose history will get every 15 minutes you can take the reading so 32 readings within 8 hours so very user friendly you can use along with the uh, even the insulin pump also thank you very much now i request ragupati sir to speak few words and conclude the session good evening everybody sir your face is not visible sir you have to stop sharing okay sir good evening everybody i'm sorry i joined late while you are talking on dka i had uh, two patients new patients arriving with the dka and uh, as usual the parents were very upset uh, with the news that the child has got diabetes and requires insulin for life and all that and uh, i was i thought i was successful in pacifying somebody and get the, getting them admitted another patient also arrived at the same time and uh, so i was held up but i am very happy that the session went off very well and there were nearly 100 participants and uh, i saw the active four of your students are here four of your student dr ahila dr riya sir me and binet i heard yeah. that <laughs> i heard that also and uh, so, so happy to see you sir thank you <laughs> thank you very much i am happy that there was active participation from the audience and uh, so well, quite a number of them came up with the right answers i'm sure if you conducted this uh, oski in the same style as dr ahila did a quiz program some time ago i'm sure <laughs> many of you would have uh, done gloriously and uh, what really pleases me is the interest shown by all the post graduates in uh, pediatric endocrinology and uh, this was the very idea with which i started this teaching program in the beginning itself and uh, we were doing it in uh, different states one by one and uh, i am so glad dr anurag also has started the same program and uh, he is uh, much more active than i am and much more younger also than my i am and uh, he is continuing this and uh, i would like all the post graduates who attended today to spread this word that we are having exam oriented training program this is what i would like you to know and uh, i wish there will be greater participation in the future and uh, 
I must really thank all the speakers, Dr. Anurag, Dr. Ahila, and uh, Dr. Riaz, and Dr. Amarnath for their active participation, and Amarnath for being the ringmaster. You oh, know? Sir. sir is very inspirational. He's just like a tiger. <laughs> so we are learn learning. So you are the ring so loving. See, sir never scolds me, I remember. And he's very much loving. He used to tell stories for one to two hours each patient. We remember everything, sir. Um, so you are controlling the tigers. That's why I said. No, sir. Wing master. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm happy oh. that program went out <laughs> well. And we expect greater participation in future. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you so much, sir. Great to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Ankit, for very good coordination. Uh, we thank the ISPE president and uh, especially the Novo Nordics for giving this uh, sponsorship. And uh, we thank you all, especially all the students who have taken active participation. We are grateful to all the uh, patients, teachers, and all the people. Thank you very much. Bye, sir. Bye, Bye Shaila. Bye, Bye. Riaz. Thank, thank you, madam. Thank, thank you. you.